Rise. Good morning. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and I now address these remarks to uh, the members of the press. Uh, you have uh, uh, not been completely in accord with uh, what I asked you to do uh, last Friday, but you've all done me the great favor of uh, obeying what I asked you to do uh, with respect to the identity of the jurors, and I thank you very much for that. Uh, we will, the first order of business after I give some preliminary remarks will be uh, the examination one by one of the jurors. And what will happen is I will bring all of the jurors in to begin with, and they will be seated. I will make remarks to the entire panel. I will then uh, ask that the jury be taken to their jury room, and I will one by one call the jurors and address them. And I will address them by a letter that I have developed rather than their number. Now, I realize full well that many of you who attended this trial for many, many weeks probably know these jurors, and I'm not making any further statement about what you do or don't do in terms of identifying the jurors, but I don't want any, photogra I don't want any photo photographs taken of the jurors uh, by the media. Uh, with respect to the rest of the audience, if you have uh, devices, uh, cell phones, iPads, or anything of that nature, uh, please uh, silence them. Uh, please do not use them. The press is uh, allowed to use their devices in order to make notes, but the press is not making any photographs either. I have a pool photographer as well as a pool uh, court TV uh, uh, arrangement, and that's what will be used to photograph, and that those uh, materials will, of course, be fed and uh, available to the press. Uh, I think if there's anything else. All right. All right. All right. Uh, the jurors are in place in the jury room, Mr. Bailiff. Yes, sir. Yes, Very good. Bring me the jurors. Yeah, please, court, your honor, prior to bring that jury in, but that puts something on the record. All right. But sure. Uh, hold for a minute. Yes, sir. Your Honor, um, you have a list of questions you've d distributed to us. Um, and yes, sir. And, of course, you went through those with juror. Z. Or X, X, X. X. I knew it was one of those yeah. last letters. Um, juror X. Um, number th the third question you say, did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comments about the merits of this case before your verdict? Yes, sir. And clearly the juror didn't understand what the word merits meant. I disagree with that, but uh, you may make your uh, record about that. I think the juror understood what was being asked. And frankly, in some of the materials that we exchanged back and forth about questions, you yourself have used the word merit. So I, I don't think she was confused. Well, Your Honor, occasionally I make a mistake. I, I think in this case, perhaps you've made a mistake. And if you would just uh, respectfully use the words, did make any comment about the case before your verdict. Just leaves out their judgment about merits. They don't know merits is a legal word. I, I will take what you say into account, but I have already examined one juror using that term, and you now say that that term confused the juror. Uh, you have that on the record, and uh, it certainly would be able to argue that to any of the appellate courts that review what I do here, but my intention is to uh, use the uh, language that I use with the juror I've already interviewed. But Your Honor, you went and did a follow-up question, our request, which elaborated on what that meant. And, and certainly, um, um, after you asked that question, we think that clarified it, and you could use merits or anything else about the case um, and, and deal with both issues. I just think it's going to require us, based on statements that these jurors have given to SWAD to ask very specific questions. Okay, I understand what you're asking. Let me ask you this, Mr. Harputlin. Do you happen to have the transcript of Friday's proceedings? Mm, I don't believe I do. Uh, State, do you all happen to have a transcript of Friday's proceedings? Your Honor, we're looking right now. 
right. yes, belay that. I, I've got a copy. Let me look at it for a minute to see what I did in clarification. And uh, so just uh, pause for a minute. Let me look at that. at this transcript and the only thing I know wait there's hang up. Up. Okay. Okay, oh, okay, the hang up. question. Okay, all right. I said this. I I asked the attorneys for any further commentary about the questions I asked and I have been asked to ask one more question and I'm going to do that. I'm going to read you a memorandum by the state to counsel for the defense and then ask you about it, all right? Uh, Is that good? And then uh, here's what I read. Per Chief Attorney Waters, please be advised that the attorney for Juro X has told us that his client says that prior to the defendant's testimony, his client did hear Clark Hill say words to the effect of, quote, looks like the defendant is going to testify, this is an important day, close quote, or, quote, this is an epic day, close quote, and that some statement, there was some statement that it was rare for a defendant to testify. And then I said, Juror X, can you verify that what I've read is something you heard and told uh, your attorney and she says yes ma'am very good Do these statements have any impact on your verdict no ma'am very good I will I will uh, ask those que that question well, I didn't change the it, well I've read you what I asked I will be glad to do that again your, your honor um, different jurors say different things based on the memorandums we've received. I, I won't say you told your attorney or anything like that, but I'll ask about that statement having been made. Your Honor, just for the record, we believe the term merits is a, uh, a, a term of art, uh, just as if you asked them was there a probable cause. Um, again, if or anything else, we're not asking you to open Pandora's box. I hear what you say, and uh, I will take it into account. Mr. Uh, Waters, anything on your, your behalf? I do not have anything further, Your Honor. We believe the uh, term is self-explanatory. Thank you, sir. You know, Mr. Harputin, I will, I'll have to go to my screen to do this other, but uh, I will, the third question will read, did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before the verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, that's, that's what I'll ask. All right. All right, Mr. Bailiff, bring me the jury.
Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the State versus Murdoch jury. Uh, I wanted to make a few opening uh, remarks to you before I question each of you. Uh, about uh, the matter. Uh, you have done absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, none of you, not any of you. You didn't ask to serve, but you served and did your duty. This was an unusually difficult trial because of its length. Six weeks is almost unheard of in South Carolina as the length of a case. It was difficult because of the intense publicity and public interest in the case. It was difficult because of the complexity of testimony and exhibits in the case. And you acquitted yourself honorably. So this question today is not about anything you did wrong. Please be assured of that. I respect you and I respect your service. Uh, Today, I'm going to ask you to do something that's difficult. This case is unique. Most of the time, if there's some issue about uh, uh, improper conduct uh, uh, or contact with a juror, it comes up immediately. The judge uh, puts questions to the juror and perhaps to the person uh, uh, who may have made an uh, improper comment, uh, and then you go on with, uh, to, book, to verdict or sometimes it's very shortly after the verdict is rendered. And again, the judge uh, questions uh, the affected jurors and the uh, uh, supposed interference and uh, makes a ruling right then and there on either uh, a new trial or a mistrial. Uh, now here, uh, we are almost a year after your beginning of service on this case. And that makes it mighty difficult for you to do something I'm going to ask you to do, and it's this. Today, I ask you to focus your attention. What is that? Mr. Bailiff, what, what is that noise? I'm not sure. Is that the sound system doing that? I believe it's the court sound system. This is the funkiest sound system in the world, so you just have to <laughs> keep up with it. I've had trouble in every case I've ever tried with uh, the sound system. So, uh, uh, jurors, if something happens and the sound system goes haywire, we'll stop for a minute until it, it stops. Now, as I was saying, I want you to focus your attention as you answer the questions I'm going to ask you on your six weeks of experience as a juror in this case and on the point in the trial where the judge charged you and on your verdict as you rendered it on March the 2nd, 2023. <coughs> That's what I want the focus to be. And again, I know I'm asking a lot to have you cast yourself back into that time, but that's what I'm, the questions I'm asking are about that time and not about this time. There has been so much drama about this matter uh, since the verdict was rendered uh, and my heart goes out to everyone, the lawyers uh, and you who are in this trial, 
Uh, that I can't help. But I've been asked by the Supreme Court uh, to take a look at this issue. Uh, the appeal is on pause until I do, and I've got to do my duty as I see it. And you do yours as I know you see it. So I thank you very much in advance for, again, the terrible inconvenience of calling you all back together now. But it's very essential to completing the record about this case and placing it before the appellate authorities as it needs to be. So in advance, I thank you. What I'm going to do now is dismiss you uh, to the jury room, and one by one, I will call you, and I will refer to you by a letter that I have just assigned you that isn't your jury number and certainly isn't your name. Uh, you know, these people in the media saw you all all through the trial. They probably know who you are. But I'm trying to do my duty as I see it when I make your uh, appearance here anonymous uh, to the record. And only the, clerk, the uh, court reporter will have a sealed uh, uh, document by me indicating what the key means in terms of your juror number and your name. So I'm do, doing everything I can do about this matter. But it goes without saying that your business is your own business. Uh, you don't have to interview with a soul uh, not lawyers, not uh, media, not anyone after this matter. That choice is purely yours. Uh, and I will respect that and protect that to the best I can if anything comes up afterwards. All right, you may go to the jury room. sitting in the jury box and called this uh, the next one, the next jury, a liar publicly. I'd ask that he, uh, that be Mr. Bland and his, his um, uh, partner, cohort, uh, not sit behind her or near her while she's testifying. Uh, I, I object. Well, I object. Just, just Your Honor, I object to him speaking. One moment, one moment, one moment. We're not going to have a big colloquy about this. Keep, you keep your seat for a moment, Mr. Yes. Harper. Yes, Your Honor. Bland, you do the same. Mr. Bender, is there a seat over next to you? There is. Uh, Mr. Bland, will you go over and sit next to Mr. Bender, please? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, I have some people in the jury box. Uh, two of them are sled agents. One of them is the media consultant, and one of them uh, is uh, attorney for uh, several of the uh, uh, jurors, Mr. Bland. <coughs> Uh, and that's being done at my uh, direction. Uh, hey, Justice Tull, you have Scott Mongello and Blaine Richter also in the jury box. Very good. There. Yes, sir. That's fine. All right. Bring me Juror Z. Juror Z, you may take the witness box after you are sworn. Uh, step over here to the clerk and she will administer the oath. you some questions and there are no right or wrong answers. Uh, the truth as, uh, uh, is what I seek and 
Why? That is the truth of what you experience in relation to these questions at the State versus Murdoch trial. You rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. That verdict was read in open court by the four person of the jury. And then uh, the court said this, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, let it be known by raising your hand. The transcript then indicates that the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled, and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate statement about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes, ma'am. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? Yes, ma'am. If yes, what did Ms. Hill say? To watch his actions. To watch his actions. What else? To watch him closely. To watch him closely. Anything else you remember? There is, but I can't remember. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and uh, was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, in any way with any, com uh, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. All right. Was your verdict influenced in any way by the communications of the clerk of court in this case? Yes, ma'am. And how was it influenced? To me, it felt like she made it seem like he was already guilty. All right, and uh, I understand that, uh, that that's the tenor of the remarks she made. Did that affect your finding of guilty in this case? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, be at ease. Those are my, my questions are submitted to the juror. Uh, are there any uh, reactions, further questions, and so forth? If there are, and you would like to voice them, I can ask the juror to retire to the jury room. Uh, just tell me whether I need to do that. All right, sir. Your Honor, can we ask the juror to, we, we need to put some things on the record. All right, All right. Uh, take the juror to the jury room, please. that was given by this particular juror. Uh, paragraph 10 uh, said, I have questions about Mr. Murdoch's guilt, but I vote guilty because I felt pressured by the other jurors. Uh, we would 
uh, request uh, an inquiry as to that, which is how, uh, when this motion was filed, she expressed uh, the basis for her verdict, uh, which obviously this answer is a little different now. Uh, so we would request uh, a, a brief inquiry from the court as to that specific issue. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, as to two things. The first thing is, he is correct. She gave an affidavit. Um, we would uh, ask Your Honor to let her read her affidavit to refresh her memory of, she said, other things. They're very detailed in here. We'd ask you to, and let me hand up to the court, um, a copy of her affidavit uh, and ask you to have her read it before. before she has any uh, other. What I have here from Mr. Waters, for the record, Mr. Waters, what I've been handed for the record is something affidavit of juror now referred to as Z. Uh, it was taken August the 14th, 2023. Uh, it was uh, sworn before Holly Miller, paralegal for Mr. Harputlin, uh, and he would like for me to give that to uh, uh, the juror and ask her to read it and then ask her about it. I'm inclined to do that, but I want to hear from you first. Uh, Your Honor, uh, again, if, if they want to re refresh the recollection, that's fine with the state, um, but uh, I, so we have no objection to that. Very good. Uh, it will be done. Your Honor, also we would ask that you not ask the question that, um, that Mr. Waters asked you to ask because it violates Rule 606B, which provides upon an inquiry the validity of a verdict or indictment, a juror may not testify to the effect of anything upon that or any other juror's mind or emotions. What was the question he asked? The, 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 if you look at that affidavit. It's paragraph 10, Your paragraph Honor. Paragraph 10. It's in the very affidavit. She said she was, influenced, she was influenced by other jurors. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask her about that. I'm going to give her the affidavit, and then I'm going to question her about it. And we would, for the record, indicate that we object to that under 606B. And Your Honor, from our perspective, uh, she's put an and issue. You're the one that asked me to have her look at this affidavit, but you're telling me I can't question about it. I, no, deny, no, no. I deny that objection. Well, Your Honor, if it's something that's inadmissible, you should not ask her about it. And that's well, you want me to admit it and have her uh, uh, examine it. No, I want you to have her read it to refresh your no, memory. We're quibbling, not... Mr. Harper, we're quibbling about things that I'm not going to take time to quibble about. My ruling is, pursuant to your request, I am going to allow the juror to examine her affidavit, and then I'm going to question her about it. That's my ruling. Your objection is overruled. For the record, I just want to note, Your Honor, just for the record. You noted 606. I hear you noted. And in no way waiving anything or opening any door by asking you to well, let her for, examine. That's for a higher court than me to decide. Well, I understand that, and that's why I want to make sure when they read this transcript, there's no confusion. I'm not asking you to put that into evidence. I'm asking you to well, let the I jury Well, I see in the world I can question the juror about something and not put it into evidence. You can't have your cake and eat it too, Mr. Harpootlin. You could have been very satisfied with the answers that were already given, but you have chosen to, a to ask We're about this. All request. All right. Denied. <laughs> Your Honor. All the time we ask witnesses Mr. to examine Harper, a prior statement. Mr. Harper, I made my ruling. Please take your seat. All right, bring me juror Z. Get me another copy. It's in here. Yeah. It's in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Madam Juror, you gave an affidavit uh, to a representative of Mr. Harputlin on August the 14th, 2023. Uh, and I have this in my hand at the present time. Uh, and I'm going to hand it to you. And I'm going to ask that you read it. Tell me when you completed reading it. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to ask you some questions. You're going to see four little boxes on this affidavit. They are uh, your name and the names of two of the jurors. I will strike that out before it appears in the record, just so you understand. Mr. Thayer, please pass this to the juror. Take a moment to read this and tell me when you have a Yes, ma'am. Very good. The second, first paragraph, for uh, of course, uh, is a statement that you are a juror in the case. Second paragraph says, toward the end of the trial after the President's Day break, but before Mr. Murdoch testified, the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill, told the jury, quote, not to be fooled, unquote, by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys which I understood to mean that Mr. Murdoch would lie when he testifies. Uh, is that uh, what your recollection is of that statement? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there anything in the statement that uh, on reflection you think is not correct? No, ma'am. All right. Number three, she also instructed the jury to, quote, watch him closely, quote, immediately before he testified, including, quote, look at his actions, quote, and, quote, look at his movements, quote, which I understood to mean he was guilty. Uh, is that an accurate uh, uh, recitation of your view of the matter? Yes, ma'am. Uh, immediate, number four, paragraph four. Immediately after he testified, the foreperson said Mr. Murdoch was cr crying on cue. Uh, is that an accurate statement of uh, what you uh, saw in the, and heard? Yes, ma'am. Five, the four person criticized the former four person for handing Mr. Murdoch a box of tissues when he was crying on the stand while testifying about his murdered son. She told the jury we cannot interact with Mr. Murdoch because that's what the defense wants us to do. Uh, do you still stand by that recitation of the, that conversation? Yes, ma'am. All right. Number six, the jury frequently discussed the case during breaks before deliberation. Is that uh, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Number seven, 
toward the end of the trial, Ms. Hill came into the jury room a lot. Is that your recollection? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Hill and the four person had private conversations on multiple occasions. The four person would tell the bailiff that she needed to speak with Ms. Hill. Ms. Hill would arrive and then she and the four person would go to another room for a private conversation. The conversations typically lasted five to 10 minutes. The four person never said anything about the content of the conversation. For example, she never communicated logistical information after these conversations. This happened two or more times, more frequently towards the end of the trial. Is that still your recollection of the interaction? Yes, ma'am. Nine, when we began deliberations, Mr. Ms. Hill told us this shouldn't take us long, quote, and if we deliberated past 11 p.m., we would be taken directly to a hotel. We had driven from our homes that morning and were not prepared to stay overnight. Additionally, smokers on the jury asked to be allowed to take smoke breaks, but they were told they could not smoke until after the deliberations were complete. Did you hear that? Yes, ma'am. Including the business about the smokers? Yes, ma'am. All right. Number 10, I had questions about Mr. Murdoch's guilt, but voted guilty because I felt pressured by the other jurors. Is that an accurate uh, statement about uh, your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Right. After the verdict and immediately before sentencing, Ms. Hill pressured the jury to speak as a group to reporters from a television show. Was, is that an accurate statement of what she said? Yes, ma'am. And did uh, jurors, some jurors declined to do that? Yes, ma'am. Juror Z, uh, I asked you previously, was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023 influenced in any way by communications from Becky Hill, the clerk of court? Uh, you answered that question, yes. In light of what you said in the affidavit, uh, which is I had questions about Mr. Uh, Murdoch's guilt, but voted guilty because I felt pressured by the other jurors. Is that answer? Uh, that I just read a more accurate statement of how you felt? Yes. Overruled. Yes, ma'am. All right. So you do stand by the affidavit? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Thank you. All right. You may go to the jury room. Uh, and let me just explain to you what the procedure will be. I'm calling the rest of the jurors, of course, one by one. When I'm finished with that, I will bring you out as a group one more time, and then you are free to leave. You don't have to stay. Okay? Very good. Uh, you may go to the jury room. What's that? Before you, this juror is excused, but after she steps out, I'd like to address All right. the court. All right. You may be excused. That's good. What I'm going to uh, try to do is redact as I, the 
uh, as I did in the, um, as you did in the document that uh, you sent me, uh, the identifying thing he redacted has, now. He has an extra copy of the redacted. I have oh, right here oh, now. good. That's great. That would be wonderful. Yeah, uh, show it to Mr. Harpootman. I've seen. Very good. Thank you. That's the one I will give to the uh, court reporter, but I think you can see that I asked off of it. This is a court's exhibit. Three. Court's exhibit three. And Your Honor, just to be clear, that does still have the juror numbers in it. It does not have the letters. Yes, uh, what I'd ask you to do, Elizabeth, is uh, take off the juror numbers, just strike them through, and then where it says affidavit of juror and gives a number, just strike that out and you can put in pen Z. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Harper. Your Honor, we objected to the questioning because this juror gave two statements under oath, one in an affidavit and one here to you today. The one here today was Becky Hill influenced her verdict. Yes. The one she gave in an affidavit six months ago was it was based on jurors. It could be both. Your Honor did, did picked out the one in the affidavit from six months ago and said, is that a more accurate statement? That presupposes and suggests to her what she should say. And uh, we believe that this, this juror's testimony, um, and, and Your Honor, I'm afraid what you're going to say is, well, she said the affidavit was more accurate than what she testified under oath here today, and therefore I'm not going to consider her testimony. And I think that's where we're heading here. I'd ask you to bring her back in, explain to her there's nothing wrong with it both being true. Uh, I decline to do that and overrule the objection. All right. Uh, Mr. Bayless? Yes, sir. Uh, counsel, I have to report this to you, and I'm uh, very, very unhappy about it, but uh, there's nothing to do but put it on the record, and then I will proceed with questioning the rest of the jurors. The jurors' cell phones were not uh, confiscated or taken from them, and they tuned this thing in on court TV and listened to all of what just went on. So... Uh, you may make whatever uh, uh, statement you like to make, and then I'm going to go on and question the jurors. I will tell you in advance, I am not going to uh, uh, stop the proceedings or uh, do anything to interrupt them. I'm going to get the rest of this on the, the record. You might imagine that they no longer have their cell phones with them. Uh, Your Honor, we have a five-minute recess to discuss what we need to put on the record. I mean, this is I'm not going to take all day on this thing. Well, I report things as they come to me. Uh, I will give you a couple of minutes, and then we're going to – they were late getting here. I didn't get to start on time like I wanted to, so I need to just calm down a little bit. But I tell you, don't take any long period of time. Court will be in recess for five minutes.
Pause. <coughs> Just a minute. Now, you're about to do something that I've already said I'm not going to allow to happen, uh, and that is you've got standing next to you a member of the team that represents the juror. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, Mr. Harput, uh, I'm not, I, I made a ruling early on uh, that uh, when Mr. McCullough was in court, when Mr. Bland was in court, that I was not going to uh, uh, Allow the, the, I allow the attorneys to participate in formulating the procedure for this hearing, but I have not I indicated that I would not allow the jury, the lawyers for jurors to participate in this hearing, and so I'm not going to do that. I can just tell you that. And if you get if what you want to do is by indirection tell me what the lawyers for the juror would say, I'm not going to accept that. Your Honor, my understanding is she'd like to approach ask if the juror can be excused. That's no, it. not yet. Uh, Your Honor, I, I actually approach... Um, now, Mr. McCullough can be excused. There's still plenty of you lawyers and you can do it. I didn't want him to come to begin with, so I love him dearly, and he can go any time. And I, I speak on behalf of Amy McCullough, his wife, when I tell you that. <laughs> Your Honor, um, I actually was here to let both of them know that I was going to ask to approach to talk about a security issue. Very All right, quickly. Well, we come up here. Lord knows, I tell you what, <laughs> Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong at the worst possible time, and Murphy was an optimist.
please be seated. Let me place upon the record two things. First of all, uh, uh, I have uh, made certain now that, that a bailiff will be in the jury room with these jurors. Uh, why that I announced that many times, uh, that that is the way it was to run. Why there wasn't a juror in the jury room is something I don't know, but uh, I have asked that that be followed rigidly. I've also asked, I don't go into jury rooms, never have and never will, but I asked the uh, bailiff to tell the jurors that they are not to discuss any testimony uh, that any of them are given. I asked Juror Z whether she was comfortable because I would be glad to place her in a separate room so that she's not uh, set upon by the rest of the jurors. She gave me a big smile and said she is perfectly comfortable. And I said, at any time you're not comfortable, you simply tell me and I will have you uh, placed in either my office or another jury room. So that's why I left it with Juror Z. I think she's fine, but I just wanted to make sure of that. Uh, and again, uh, on the record, uh, the conversation I had with her was outside the jury room. I, I don't go into the jury room for any reason. Very good. Mr. Bayer? Yes, sir. For the record, Your Honor, we would ask, as jurors are brought in, uh, we would ask that you ask them if they've watched or heard anything this morning from their cell phone or other jurors about what occurred in here this morning with uh, Juror Z. Um, and if so, what was it? I'm going to say, ask uh, each one of them something about this. Whether it's exactly what you want, I don't know. But I uh, uh, will ask them uh, uh, something about this or make some direction to them about it. I'm not going to get into a who shot John about what they said in that jury room today. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I will try to, uh, as best I can, uh, uh, deal with this question of who her, of, of them hearing parts of the examination of juror Z. Your Honor, this morning I think you already instructed them not to discuss this matter, these matters among themselves. So if they have violated that, um, again, I think it's important for you to make that inquiry. I, I'm going to make it as I see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, bring me juror C. 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 I will address you as juror C because I've re-designated uh, from your juror number um, at Colleton to letters of the alphabet. Uh, I am trying to uh, uh, protect the anonymity of uh, the jury's jurors as best I can. I uh, can't promise you with all the time that uh, they spent seeing you all uh, in the trial of the case that uh, they won't uh, uh, <coughs> figure out who is who, but on my record here, uh, which is all I can control, um, I will address you as Juror C. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and before I begin, I understand that there may have been some cell phones uh, activated in the jury room and the watching of the questioning of Juror Z. Did that take place? Um, I know people were on cell phones, but I'm not sure of what they were watching. 
Were you on a telephone? No, ma'am, I was not. Very good. I don't think I have to go any further then. Thank you, sir. Uh, you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2022. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury, and the court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your hand. The transcript then indicated that the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled, and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in the case? Yes, ma'am. Did you hear Becky Hill, clerk of court for Collington County, make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am. I wasn't purview to any of that. All right, sir. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No, ma'am, it was not. Very good. That completes my questions. Uh, you may retire to the jury room. Bring me juror F. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have designated the jurors by a letter, and that's how I will be addressing you this morning, and I will be addressing you as Juror F. Now, I realize that you folks were on the jury for a long time, over six weeks, and uh, people may, may know who you are, uh, despite my efforts to uh, protect this record. But to the extent I can, I will protect this record and your anonymity as a juror in this record. So just wanted you to understand why I'm addressing you as juror F.
This morning it was brought to my attention that some jurors were uh, perhaps on their phones listening or looking at the, a broadcast of the questions to the first juror I examined, Juror Z. Uh, is that something that you know anything about or experienced? Yes, ma'am. Did you activate your own phone? Another juror did. All right. Uh, and uh, will what you saw and what you looked at in any way affect your testimony as you're about to give it? No, ma'am. Very good. <clears throat> you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court and signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript that indicates that the juror complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Was your answer an accurate uh, answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Absolutely. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am. Was that was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way by any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? Absolutely not. Very good. That's all the questions I have. Discuss the matter with you before we finish with this. Jury. You may go to your jury room uh, and keep yourself ready. I don't know if I'm going to have any further questions, but uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the questions uh, that I'm asking are at an end, but I need to consult with the attorneys before I can dismiss you. You may go to your jury room. Yes, sir. Your Honor, in interviewing um, the clerk of court uh, for Barnwell County, who worked as an assistant to Ms. Hill during this um, trial, and interviewing the alternate juror, uh, who was not, I mean, wasn't needed, wasn't dismissed for any particular reason other than it wasn't needed, um, both of them indicate they believe that Ms. Hill transported um, this juror by her personal vehicle or a bailiff's vehicle uh, at least once during the trial. So I would ask you, you ask her, during the trial, did Becky Hill either drive or ride with you after, in a vehicle before or after court? If so, what, if anything, did Becky Hill and you discuss? All right, what's your position on that, Mr. Waters? Uh, Your Honor, I have no objection to that. Yes, all right. All right, bring the juror. This is Juror C, returning to the stand. The same juror, yes. Uh, of course, you're still under oath, uh, and I have this question for you. <coughs> During the trial, did Becky Hill either drive or ride with you in a vehicle before or after court? If so, what, if anything, did Becky Hill and you discuss? Do you recall that at all? 
Um, could you please ask that again? Ma'am? Could you please ask the question again? Sure. Sorry. During the trial, did Becky Hill either drive or ride with you in a vehicle before or after court? No, ma'am. All right. Then the, I don't need to ask a second question. Uh, this will conclude your testimony. You are dismissed. I'm going to ask the uh, jurors to stay with me until I've completed this process, and then you are free to go. Thank you so much. Uh, Question zero F is court's exhibit number four. your left hand on the Bible, right hand up, and face the court. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case today to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help God? Thank you so much. I, I have re-designated each of the jurors in the record for this case. Uh, and so I will be referring to you as Juror L, as in Lima. Uh, and, you know, y'all are all on this jury. <laughs> if these people saw you for six weeks, they may know uh, or be able to identify you, but I'm trying to, as best I can, uh, protect your anonymity. You don't have to talk to anybody about this uh, at all. That's purely your prerogative. Uh, Before uh, uh, you came to testify uh, and were sworn, uh, you were in the jury room with the other jurors. Yes, I understand that some may have looked at their cell phones and looked at pictures of the proceedings as they involved the first juror who was examined. Uh, did you see any of that? People had their phones out, yes, ma'am. Uh, did you look at any of it? No, ma'am. All right. And I don't need to ask you anything further about that. Uh, you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury, and the court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if, this, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was then individually polled, and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, Madam Justice, yes. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes, Justice. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear Becky Hill, the clerk of court for Colleton County, make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am. Was your verdict on March 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No, ma'am. 
Very good. Uh, Juror L, uh, thank you, and you are dismissed. Uh, I will send word back by the bailiff if there are any further questions. I always ask the lawyers that before I uh, uh, dismiss the juror completely and go to the next one. Please know that I will keep you in case there's anything I need to have the whole jury uh, for at the end of this proceeding. Uh, then you're free to go and you don't have to speak to a soul about any of this. Thank you, sir. Uh, anything further, Mr. Uh, mistake, Your Honor. Nothing to the defense, Your Honor. Very good. All right, Mr. Bailiff. Bring me juror E. He is in Edward? Yes. Sir, I will be addressing you as Juror E this morning. I've re-designated uh, the jurors by letter. I realize that you sat on this uh, jury in Carlton County for a lengthy period of time, six weeks or better, and people may know who you are, but to the extent I can make this record uh, a record that protects your anonymity, I am doing that. Uh, you don't have to speak to a soul about this matter uh, after you're finished, uh, uh, and uh, 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 your service will be complete, as I'm sure you thought it would be when you entered your verdict. I have these questions. You rendered a verdict. Oh, yes. Uh, I, it was brought to my attention that cell phones of the jurors were accessed in the jury room for a time uh, and that some were able to examine uh, the broadcast of the testimony of the first juror called uh, Juror Z. Uh, was your cell phone one of those activated to look at the proceedings? No, ma'am. Did you look at the proceedings on any other cell phone? No, ma'am. Thank you. Now, you rendered your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court signed by the four person of the jury. The jury then said, I mean the court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? It was. Was your verdict based entirely upon the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? No. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023 influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No. Thank you, sir. That completes my questions. You may go to the jury room. I always consult with the lawyers to see if there are any further questions. If there are not, please stay with the jury until I dismiss all of you. I'm hoping that won't be too much longer. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
All right. Anything from the state? And from the defendant. Very good. Uh, bring me juror P, as in Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, man. I will be addressing you as juror P, as in Paul. I've tried to uh, redesignate the jurors uh, without their number and, of course, without their name. Now, I realize you spent six long weeks here in this case in open court in Colleton, and many people may know who you are anyway. But to the extent that I can make this record uh, such that it protects your anonymity, I'm going to do that. Yes, sir. And you certainly are not obligated to talk with one soul about this matter. Uh, did you have your cell phone? No, ma'am. Did you examine any cell phone broadcasts? Uh, there was a couple people, but I have no clue what they were viewing. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did any of this activity by other people in viewing uh, this material have any impact on, on you in terms of your testimony today? No, ma'am. All right. Uh, you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors comply. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? It was. Did you hear Becky Hill, clerk of court for Clarendon County, make any comment about this case before your verdict? I did, yes ma'am. Uh, what did she say? Um, it was the day that Mr. Murdoch was taking the stand. Yes sir. And um, she made a comment about watch his body language. About watch I'll his? Watch his body language. His body language, I see. Yes ma'am. And I, what else? Um, that's all I can recall. All right, sir. Uh, was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No. All right. Uh, that completes my questions, uh, uh, Juror uh, E. Uh, or P. P. Juror P. Uh, you may go to your jury room. You are, are uh, uh, free to refuse to discuss this with anybody. That's your, that's your prerogative. You're not required to talk about this anymore. Uh, that's your business. Uh, I've tried to do the best I could to uh, confine this thing, but uh, I appreciate your service. Thank you, sir, and you may go to your jury room. Thank you, ma'am.
Any questions by the state? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. All right, by the defendant? Nothing, Your Honor. All right. Uh, bring me juror O. 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 Good morning, Juror O. I have re-designated uh, uh, the jurors by letter uh, in this record uh, so as to try to protect your anonymity as best I can. Now, I realize you sat on this case for six weeks in open court in Carlton County, and many may know uh, your identity, but to the extent I can with the record of this matter, I'm trying to preserve your identity uh, from any disclosure in this court. Juror O, I understand that several jurors may have activated their cell phone during the testimony of the first juror and looked at the proceedings. Uh, uh, are you aware of that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you activate your cell phone? No, ma'am, I did not. Did you watch any of the other cell phones? No, ma'am, I did not. Very good. Uh, you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am, it was. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am, I did not. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this matter? No, ma'am, it was not. Very good. That concludes my questions. Uh, uh, you may return to your jury room. I ask that you stay until I've completed the questioning of the jurors. You don't have to talk to a soul about this matter. It's purely your prerogative. And if you have any difficulties in that matter, let me know. Yes, ma'am. You are excused. Mr. Very quickly, I think uh, question two. I don't know that we did question two. Uh, okay. Is there Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes, ma'am, it was. Very good. You're excused. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Water. All right, bring me juror Y. Oh, excuse me, sorry. All right, nothing further, Mr. Water. Thank you.
affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I will be addressing you as juror Y. I've tried to uh, re-identify the jurors so as to preserve your anonymity in this record. Now, I know that you sat on this case for six weeks in open court, and many have seen you. They may know who you are. But as, to the extent I can preserve your anonymity in the uh, record of this case, uh, I have tried to do so. Thank you. Uh, you are completely free not to talk to a soul about this matter. Uh, that's always your prerogative. I understand that uh, uh, before uh, you came out here, when the first juror to be examined was being examined, that some jurors may have activated their cell phones. Uh, were you one who activated your cell phone? No, ma'am. Were you aware that some cell phones might have been activated? I, I was aware after the fact. All right, sir. So, uh, did you hear anything about the examination of the first juror? No, ma'am. Thank you, sir. You rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, <coughs> signed by the full person of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? And each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes, ma'am. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? Not to me, ma'am. Did you hear her make a comment to anybody else? Not that I'm aware, ma'am. All right, sir. So you don't remember any details of any conversation? No, ma'am. All right, sir. Uh, was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way by any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No, ma'am. Thank you, sir. That completes my questions. I am going to excuse you. Stay together with the other jurors until I've completed my examination, and then you will be free to go. Thank you so much. Anything further from the state? From the defense, Your Honor. Very good. Bring me juror W. Good morning. Good morning. I'll address you as juror W. I have redesignated by letter uh, the identities of the jurors uh, as I question them today. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, uh, you know, you sat on this jury for six long weeks, and I'm sure that uh, uh, those who 
were uh, there in the trial for a long period of time may know who you are. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing the very best I can to make your uh, participation in this matter anonymous, yes. and I will preserve that anonymity. You are free to not talk to one single soul about this if you don't want to. That's purely your prerogative. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, when the first juror was being questioned, some members of the jury, uh, as you were back in the jury room, may have activated their cell phones. Uh, were you one who activated your cell phone? No, ma'am. I left my phone in the car. Uh, and uh, did you hear any uh, uh, information coming from anybody else's cell phones about that examination? Um, I did. All right. Uh, ha does that have any impact on the testimony you are going to give today? No, ma'am. Very good. Uh, you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this matter? Yes, ma'am. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill, the clerk of court for Clarendon County, make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this matter? No, ma'am. Very good. Uh, that is the end of my questions, Madam Juror. You may go to the jury room stay with the jury until I've completed the questioning and then you're free to go and you're free not to say anything you don't want to say and if anybody uh, uh, upsets you or bothers you in any way about that you just let the court know. Yes, Thank you. Any further questions from the state? Any further questions Nothing from the defense, Your Honor. Very good. All right. Bring me your juror Q. Good morning. I will be referring to you as juror Q. I have redesignated every one of the jurors by a letter. Uh, and in that way, I'm trying to protect your anonymity in these proceedings. Now, I realize that you spent six long weeks hearing this case in open court in Carlton County. And some folk may know who you are, but I'm trying to protect your anonymity in these proceedings as best I can. You don't have to speak to a soul about these proceedings uh, after you have completed uh, your testimony. That's purely up to you. And if anybody hassles you about anything, the court stands ready to assist. 
you rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked, was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer? Yes, ma'am, it was. About your verdict at the time? Yes. All right. Uh, was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes, it was. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill make any comment about this case before your verdict? No, ma'am. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023 influenced in any way with any communication by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No, ma'am, it was not. Very good. You may be excused, and uh, if you'll just stay in the jury room till we've completed the examination of all the jurors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, very briefly, um, uh, I know we were doing the cell phone inquiry uh, yes. with the various jurors. Yes. I don't know if you wanted to have that with this particular juror as well. Sure. I understand that uh, before uh, I began uh, questioning you or the other jurors on the questioning of the first jurors some jurors in the assembly room may have activated their cell phones were you one of the jurors that activated your cell phone yes ma'am all right uh, and uh, was anything that you heard at that time something that has any influence or effect on the testimony you now give under oath no ma'am all right Thank you. Anything further? You may go to the jury room. For the state. Uh, nothing, Your Honor. Nothing, Your Honor. All right. Bring me juror K. Good morning. I will be addressing you as Juror K. I redesignated each of you jurors and gave you a letter for purposes of this hearing. I'm trying to protect your anonymity as best I can. Now, I realize you sat for six long weeks on this case in Carlton County, and many folk may know who you are. But on the record of this matter, as best I can, I'm trying to preserve your anonymity. Please uh, know that uh, you don't have to answer anybody's questions about this matter in any way, shape, or form, purely up to you. And if anything uh, is done that uh, uh, you feel is harassing or makes you uncomfortable, you contact the court. We'll, we'll uh, try to do as best I can to uh, help in that situation. Yes, Your Honor. All right. I understand that uh, during the testimony of the first juror, uh, some opened their cell phones in the jury room, uh, in our jury assembly room here. Uh, were you one who opened her cell phone? Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, did you uh, listen to the or watch the broadcast of that first juror's examination? Who on Facebook? Ma'am? I was on Facebook. It was on Facebook, and you, uh, you, you watched it? No, we closed it. All right. Uh, did anything that you heard in that uh, uh, Facebook uh, cell phone access uh, impact or influence your testimony in this matter in any way? No. All right. You rendered a verdict on March the 2nd, 2023. The verdict was read in open court, signed by the foreperson of the jury. The court then said, Madam Forelady and members of the jury, if that is your verdict of each and every juror, please let it be known by raising your right hand. The transcript then indicates the jurors complied. The jury was individually polled and each was asked was that your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Each juror was then asked, is that still your verdict? Each juror answered yes. Was that an accurate answer about your verdict at that time? Yes. Was your verdict based entirely on the testimony, evidence, and law presented to you in this case? Yes. Did you hear Ms. Becky Hill, the clerk of court for, County, uh, for Colleton County, make any comment about this case before your verdict? No. Was your verdict on March the 2nd, 2023, influenced in any way with any communications by the clerk of court, Becky Hill, in this case? No. Thank you, ma'am. That completes my questions. Uh, I'll let you go to the jury room now. I'll then ask the attorneys whether there are any further questions. Uh, uh, if there are not, please just stay in the jury assembly room until I give you the word that you are all to come uh, out one more time and I dismiss you. Thank you, ma'am. For the uh, state. Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Nothing for the bench, Your Honor. Very good. All right. This then completes the uh, questioning of the jurors. I will ask the jurors to come into the open courtroom again, uh, thank them, and dismiss them. Anything further before I do that? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. for the record that I be uh, able to question juror Z to follow up on what I believe the court is confused about. Very good. Uh, I deny the request. Anything further? All right, bring me the jury. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that completes uh, the court's examination of the jurors in this matter. Uh, I uh, can only deeply apologize to you for having to inconvenience you so long after the trial of this case to 
come here, and I very much appreciate your candor. There are no right or wrong answers to the questions I asked you, but I think each of you, to the best of your ability, answered the questions, and I am deeply grateful for that, as is the state of South Carolina, as is the defendant. Uh, you don't have to speak to a soul about this matter if you don't want to. That's purely your prerogative. If there's any difficulty you encounter about this hearing that I can help with, please contact the court, and I'll be happy to do so. Uh, you are dismissed this time. You may go. Uh, thank you for your service. Excuse the jurors. Mr. Waters, is the clerk of court available? Uh, yes, ma'am. It's my uh, understanding she is, and the state's prepared to call her uh, when court is ready. All right. I don't believe she's in the courtroom, uh, but she, she, I believe she's uh, at a location. Mr. Lewis is here uh, just a, a block or two away, so if we take a brief recess, so we'd be prepared to present her after that. Well, my, uh, I, would, I, I will entertain going on and taking an early lunch break. Uh, I don't know how long Ms. Hill's testimony is going to take, uh, but uh, if that might be a better thing than hanging around here, I think that's what I would prefer to do. Mr. Harputlin? Your Honor, I need uh, sustenance. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, good. Uh, I think I will join you in that. Uh, what I will do is uh, I will uh, recess court until uh, One fifteen. Uh, please return at one fifteen.
Please be seated. State ready to proceed? Ready to proceed. I think they're still getting the defendant ready to sit down. But we're Very good. Uh, we certainly will wait on that, Mr. Harputman. Uh, Your Honor, once he's seated, I have a matter I need to put on the record. All right, sure. proceeding and evaluate the evidence, uh, we argued that you should use uh, a case called Bremer. You rejected that. Um, but under any standard, as I understand it, the burden of proof is on the defendant to show certain statements were made or certain conduct happened. Um, so far, Your Honor has called as court witnesses uh, 12 witnesses. Um, we were not offered the opportunity to cross-examine them, and so we've not had the opportunity to present any evidence whatsoever. And before the state presents evidence, I believe that we should be able to call witnesses. And I would ask the court to allow us to present some evidence before the state comes up uh, with, with uh, rebuttal. And by the way, uh, under the cases you've cited, they have no affirmative obligation to present anything at this point. There's no requirement they, pre they present anything. So I would ask you to allow us to call uh, a witness or two before you uh, make a decision as to whether or not they need to call a witness. The state? Uh, Your Honor, uh, we obviously have argued uh, very extensively some of the cases, and I think the South Carolina jurisprudence is very clear um, that while an evidentiary hearing is appropriate, and that's what we're doing here, uh, that that um, manner of inquiry is, is purely within the discretion as the trial judge sees fit. This is not a criminal trial. Uh, where uh, we're here with a jury to present the normal uh, you know, criminal trial process. This is an inquiry that is very much directed uh, by the trial court and what the trial court uh, thinks is appropriate. And so the state certainly is comfortable with the inquiry the uh, court is conducting. Uh, and my understanding is, as far as putting up uh, Ms. Hill, uh, this is the manner in which the court wanted that evidence presented. And so we're happy to comply in that regard. But we think uh, um, that, uh, that this inquiry is, is within your discretion and, uh, and we have no issue with the manner uh, in which uh, your Honor's proposed to conduct it. Please the court, Your Honor. Certainly the conduct of this hearing is within your discretion. What is not <clears throat> is who has the burden of proof. We do. And we can't meet that burden if we can't call witnesses. And so I'd ask the court to allow us to call witnesses. Um, and if at the conclusion of us presenting those, um, you believe the state uh, has required to present evidence um, to counter dick that evidence or in some way I'm not quite sure since Remmer is not the standard I'm not quite sure um, what they have to prove but but that, that's a, an argument down the line I believe we ought to be able to call witnesses now um, and we have witnesses which would substantiate the burden we have to show you that statements were made by the clerk of court and that those uh, statements um, had impact on a juror or jurors. All right. I, uh, I've got a couple of reactions to that. Number one, uh, the pretrial was the time to, to figure out exactly what we were going to do here. Uh, and uh, I think it comes uh, uh, at the last minute for you to now come and say we want to present witnesses. Uh, you briefed the matter of witnesses. We had a long pretrial. Uh, after I made my rulings on what I thought the scenario uh, was that should be used based on state versus uh, green, uh, you lodged objections to that, but you did not offer at that time any information about who you wanted to call other than this lengthy uh, uh, filing in one of your briefs. Uh, 
I, it, it comes uh, pretty late in time for, uh, in my view, uh, for you to do that now. Second thing is, uh, I gave the defense a big break when I allowed you to be the cross-examiner and the state to be the presenter of uh, Becky Hill. Uh, she's really uh, uh, a witness that uh, each side needs to prove their view of what uh, uh, happened uh, in this matter. Uh, the state puts her up to uh, try to show that uh, uh, there was no impact by anything she said and that some of the things your witnesses say were said uh, she says we're not, so there's a conflict in the evidence there. Uh, I'm not going to rearrange the uh, situation and go to any witnesses of yours right now. I'm going to see what Ms. Hill has to say, and then uh, afterwards we can talk about uh, whether there's any need for any other witnesses. Your Honor, I would just factually argue this with you. We did not understand. We assumed you'd adopt Remmer. Because that well, was I don't know why you assume that because when the that's South United Carolina Supreme Court said very clearly that we do not go by the guidance of the 1950s case of uh, U.S. v. Rimmer. That's, we do not believe that's what Justice Kittredge uh, has said. Well, in, he said it straight out as clear as a bell can be, but I've ruled on that. Yes, ma'am. All, all I'm you, saying and, is and the South Carolina Supreme Court's going to have plenty of chances to decide that they want to modify Green. Well, when we were, we were somewhat taken aback by a ruling, as a result, and that ruling came um, at a point where uh, we, hadn't, we didn't know what these witnesses were going to testify to. So we now, and by the way, you've set aside three days for this. What's the hurry? This gentleman is, you know, is facing life with no parole. We should take this in a very deliberate way. He's got a 14th Amendment right um, to have, to ensure that All he had a fair trial. All these arguments should have been made before this time, Why? Mr. Bar well, Mr. Harcourt, I've told you how I'm going to handle this thing. Your objections are noted and they're on the record. But right now, what I'm going to do is what I said I would do. Uh, we're going to call Ms. Hill and see what she has to say. I have no idea who all you want to call as witnesses or whether they're here in the courtroom at the present time. Uh, but we'll get to that after Ms. Hill testifies. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Just to help me bring to your attention um, this evening. Let, let me go to a little something here that uh, I'm just getting an email on uh, and put this on the record right now. I have a communication from Mr. McCullough the 19 today. that's only, that, that, that is copied to Mr. Harputlin, Mr. Griffin, Mr. Waters, and Attorney General Wilson. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, says his client, uh, Juror Z, uh, wants to enhance the testimony she gave with some sort of affidavit that uh, uh, he wants me to look at, and I have looked at. Uh, I, uh, will, I want to hear from the state and the defense, but I can tell you I'm not inclined to uh, get back into the testimony that's already been taken by these jurors. Uh, her inconsistencies, whatever they are, are in the record, uh, and she now wants to have another bite at the apple. I'm not at all enthusiastic about that, uh, but I will uh, hear from you, Mr. Waters, first. Uh, Your Honor, the jurors testified. The, the court conducted the inquiry that needed to be conducted. She answered the questions. Uh, I would agree with Your Honor that, um, that uh, multiple bites at the apple are, are uh, uh, not warranted, um, and so we, we would believe we should proceed forward as the court has indicated. All right. Mr. Harputlin? Your Honor, I'd note two things. The first thing is we asked to be able to examine this juror. You denied that request. Number two, she's not our witness. She's not 
Mr. Waters' witness. She was the court's witness and a juror that, and you commended all of them on their honesty. She's attempting to be honest. This is, this process we're going through is an effort to seek the truth. This is the truth. I don't understand why it can't come in. I think I understand what your position is, Mr. So we'd ask you to make it a part of the record. You can say you're going to consider it. You're not going to consider it, but it should be a part of the record. Well, uh, I'll give some thought to whether uh, this thing should be a part of the record, but I can tell you this. Witnesses don't get to get on the stand and testify under oath and uh, then uh, uh, seek to add or change or uh, deal in any way with their testimony. Those questions were very open-ended questions uh, that asked for her responses and she gave them. If they're inconsistent, uh, she can't come up now and try to uh, close the loop of consistency by some additional testimony. Uh, and uh, I, I uh, am not thinking about allowing that to be done. With all due respect, Your Honor, we believe, and we said at the time, the way you questioned her put her in a position of saying, yes, that was my verdict then. We think, and we couldn't examine her, and Your Honor, <laughs> to, to say now that this affidavit doesn't accurately depict her position is to deny fact, the I, truth. You've already said that once. I know uh, your uh, uh, position on that matter, uh, but I decline to adopt it. All right. We, we, we'd make this uh, ex an, uh, an exhibit as a proffer for our case, this affidavit, we proffer it for our case. Uh, we have the burden here. I'll give some thought to it. I'm not ready to uh, uh, deal with that right now. I just, I, I have looked at it just in the moment right before I uh, put it on the record. Uh, I'll do some research about that and we'll kind of close that loop before the uh, end of the day. Your Honor, again, I indicate we have two more days. We don't have to wrap everything up today. Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Waters. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Rebecca Hill. All right. Keep this and bring it to the courtroom. Good afternoon, Ms. Hill. How are you? I'm fine. Um, I want to get started, if you would, if you could state your uh, full name for the record and spell it for the court reporter, please. My name is Becky Hill, last name Hill, H-I-L-L. Um, and uh, if you would, just uh, give us, you're currently the uh, clerk of court for Colleton County, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and just very quickly, if you would, what year were you uh, elected as clerk of court? At the end of 2020. At the end of 2020? Yes. And uh, prior to that, did you have any involvement or experience with the uh, state judicial system? I did. And could you tell the court what that was, please? I was a South Carolina official court reporter for about 14 years. All right. And were you, uh, in being an official court reporter, you would serve in the courtroom, which is Ms. Harris is here today, is that correct? Or, That's or what correct. Was your, all right. And was that primarily in the 14th Circuit? It was primarily in the 14th Circuit. However, I did travel throughout the state. Right. Um, did you have any other uh, experience in, your, in professional experience prior to becoming a court reporter or a clerk of court? I was a court reporter uh, freelance for two years before that. Okay, and then any other professional uh, pursuits you've had over the course of your career? Uh, I was able to be a middle school teacher. 
and I worked for the Board of Disabilities for a few years as well. Um, let me go ahead and, and just kind of get straight to it. Um, in your uh, capacity as clerk of court and in your previous experience being a court reporter, uh, were you familiar with the, the rules that apply to court staff as it, as it comes to interactions with jurors in the course of a criminal trial or a civil trial for that matter? Yes. All right. And uh, could you tell the court uh, generally what those rules are as far as, as what contact is permissible and what contact is not permissible, just very quickly? The judge gives the, the law and gives the instructions for a jury and uh, the attorneys will state their opening argument, their opening statements, their closing arguments, and basically uh, the clerk of court and anyone else, um, court reporter, we're there to, uh, my understanding would be to make sure that everyone's taken care of. Do you need some Kleenex? Do you need some water? Different things like that, just to make sure that they're taken care of. Is it, is it common for clerks of court uh, to have interaction with jurors during the course of a trial to see to those various logistical needs that you, that you just described? Yes. And did that happen in the Murdoch case? It did. Uh, and can you give us an example of some of the logistical things that you, or other things that you would see to to, uh, to deal with any needs that the jurors may have? I mean, did you provide them food, coffee, uh, make sure they were comfortable, things like that? Yes, all of that provide blankets for them if they were cold? Our courtroom was very cold in Colleton County, yes. Um, did you uh, provide them with aspirin or Tylenol if they needed, make sure coffee and snacks were available? Yes. Uh, did you take lunch orders for them so that they were fed each day? Yes. Um, at any time, did you interact with any juror in an attempt to influence their view of the facts in the State v. Murdoch case? No. All right, now I want to ask you some specifics about that um, and some allegations that have been raised. Um, at any time did you tell the jury not to be fooled by evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys? I did not. At any time did you instruct the jury to watch him closely and look at his actions? I did not. At any time did you instruct the jury or tell the jury to look at his movements? No. At any time as the jury moved to deliberate, did you uh, tell the jury uh, this shouldn't take long? No. At any time did you tell the jury uh, that the defense case, watch out for the defense case, they're going to try to throw you off, or anything along those lines that was meant to influence the jurors against Mr. Murdoch? No. <clears throat> Let me ask you um, if you ever made any comment to the jurors uh, about um, the fact that the defendant was going to testify. Did you, have a con did you have a conversation in the presence of the jurors prior to the defendant testifying about the fact that he was about to testify? It wasn't directly related to the jurors. I was talking to Mr. Bill, who was our bailiff foreman, mm -hmm. our bailiff um, over the jury, and I was talking to him about that. All right, and what did you say? I told him what I had just come from downstairs telling my uh, security and bailiff office, that Judge Newman had allowed more testimony in regarding the uh, financials, and that also the defendant had decided that he may testify. All right. And where were the jurors at the point that that conversation occurred? There were a few jurors uh, standing in line and there were some in the bathroom, I'm sure because they said they were waiting on jurors to get out of the bathroom. And there were some in the jury room just milling around from what I could see looking down the hallway. Right. And, uh, and again, what were, what, were the, what were the words that you said in, during that conversation? What were the effect of them? To Mr. Bill. Yeah, and what did you say? I told him that, the, that Judge Newman had, was allowing more of the financial evidence in, which would prolong the, the testimony in the trial a little bit, and also that the defendant had decided that he was going to testify. Right. Did you say anything about this being an important day, pay attention, we'll get coffee for you? things like that during I, that 
I usually give a little pep talk to the jurors. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard sitting a long time, but my usual, and I do remember saying, pay attention, it's a big day today. Whatever you need, let Mr. Bill know or one of the other bailiffs and they'll be glad to get it for you. Did your comments or were your comments in any way phrased in favor of one side or against another side or were they at more of a neutral comment about paying attention? No, it was not for one side or the other. Were you um, present when the jury went to the Moselle property uh, to, to induct the jury view? I was. All right. And was Judge Newman there as well? He was. Um, during uh, the time that you were on the property, traveling there, traveling back, did you have any conversation with the jurors where you made any comment about the substance of any testimony or any comment about the merits or the strength of the case? No, no. Uh, did you have a uh, quick comment uh, to the four lady about the, how the property was beautiful and, and there were tree, tea olive trees there that, that bloom and smell good or words to that effect? I did. All right. And was there any other conversation uh, related that you had that you, where you made any comment about the, the case or the merits or anything like that? Oh, no. No. During the course of this trial, uh, did you have a bailiff employee whose primary job it was to see to the jury and, and, and their security and to keep them separate from, uh, from everyone else that was involved in this trial? I did. And who was that? Mr. Bill Polk. All right. And he was ultimately the jury coordinator in this particular case? That's correct. Right. Um, during the course of the uh, the the deliberations once the jury went back there, uh, did you have any contact with the juries or uh, have any substantive discussion with them? Not at all. Did you uh, have any discussion with them about logistics, about staying in a hotel or anything like that? I did not. Um, did you have any interaction with the jurors or any anything to do with them having smoke breaks or anything like that? I did not. During the uh, course of the trial, did you have any discussion or interaction with the jurors about them giving any interviews to the media or, or making themselves available to the media? I'm asking during the course of the trial. Itself. No, not during the course of the trial. After the verdict had been reached and the case was in sentencing, did you have any conversation with any jurors at that time after they had already uh, entered their verdict and been individually polled? Yes, after the sentencing. All right, and tell the court what that interaction was at that time. There were several outlets, news outlets, that wanted to um, interview the jury as a whole and really wanted to get them up to North to New York. Um, and so I was trying to get a hold of all the jurors to talk about that. That was something we had not prepared for. Did you at all pressure the jurors to speak or did you just tell them that it was their option to speak or not and here's the contact information? There was, I did not pressure the jury right. to speak, no. Did, did you advise them that it was their decision and their decision alone whether or not they wished to speak to the media? It was totally their decision. And did you advise them of that? Yes, yes. time did you make any comment to any juror or in the presence of any juror in which you at all tried to influence them in favor of one side or against another? I did not. Did you understand being a longtime court employee and clerk of court that that is outside the boundaries of what is appropriate interactions with the jurors during the course of the trial? Absolutely. 
And did at any time did you violate that rule that you understood? I did not. Of course, indulgence one moment. time you're on. Please record your honor. Mr. Harputin, on cross-examination. <clears throat> Ms. Hill, we spent six weeks together, didn't we? We did. And during those six weeks, uh, you were as helpful to me as you could be, correct? I was. Accommodated just about every request I made. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wait one minute. Where were we? Oh, yeah, we're old friends. I want to be sure you can be heard. Uh, that was the microphone that was supposed to. Uh, and you're fine where you are. Absolutely fine. Yes, ma'am. It was a stage microphone that was obscuring my ability to question a witness. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, what I'm wondering is whether you can be heard without a microphone. Do we need to try to get a microphone um, up I on can this hold podium? This mic over if yeah, that would be good. All right. I don't know who's supposed to hear this other than you, but um, I assume they can hear us. The court reporter, I'm sorry. She's more important, not as important as you. Yes, I agree. Um, oh, yeah, we're old friends, right? We spent six weeks together in a very pressure-filled situation, correct? It was a long six weeks. It was a long six weeks. And um, during those six weeks, <clears throat> you were helpful to me in a number of different ways, um, accommodating friends that I had that wanted to come watch the trial, for instance, correct? That's correct. You even allowed me to use the private restroom down on the first floor so I didn't have to stand in line with the rest of the people um, trying to get breaks, correct? Correct. So we have no animosity towards each other. You didn't do something to me and I didn't do something to you during that trial, right? Absolutely. Okay. Now. Given that, I'm going to ask you some questions today <clears throat> that may indicate to you that I have um, some antagonism towards you. Let me disabuse you of that. I'm here doing a job representing my client. And you've been around the court system for decades, correct? Yes, sir. So you understand what we're doing here today? Yes. Now, <clears throat> let me understand a couple of things. I think, and I've read your book, one, some editions of your book. There are several. We got a bunch of um, emails in which you have drafts that you forwarded to your co-author, correct? Your Honor, objection. I believe uh, I would object to relevance. I believe uh, any draft she sent to her co-author with the book is beyond the scope of this inquiry here today. Overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And in those drafts, um, you say certain things um, about the trial about um, the process, which you later did not include in the, the final version. It's called editing, is that correct? I would agree with that. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about this book for just a second. It, um, when did you first decide you were gonna write a book? I think a thought was there, a very fleeting thought before the trial. Did you take any steps before the trial or at the initiation of the trial to begin writing this book or working with somebody on this book? Oh, no, sir. When did you and your co-author get together? 
It was several weeks after the trial. Okay. Did you talk to anybody about the fact you were going to write a book before the trial? There were several uh, anchors and several journalists that I did speak with about the possibility of writing a book. Um, did, oh, I'm so disorganized, I apologize. Um, did, do you know, did you seek assistance in this trial from other clerks of court? Yes, sir, I did. And who were they? Rhonda McElveen, who is the Barnwell County Clerk of Court, and Renee Elvis from the Horry County Clerk of Court. And um, did they, were they there with you the entire six weeks? No. I mean, how, much, how long were they there? How, how often were they there? Rhonda McElveen was there as often as she could be, probably several times a week. Renee Elvis helped me during the jury selection. with you prior to jury selection. Can you repeat that question? Was she, we began jury selection, I think, on January 23rd, correct? Correct. Was she working with you or consulting with you prior to the 23rd? No, sir. Did you have any conversation with her about the trial? Not until she got to the trial on what, I can't remember the exact day she came. Okay. Now, is she a friend of yours? She was a friend, yes. Was? Well, she is a friend. Okay. Yes. And she's done nothing to make you any less a friend? No, sir. Now, um, <clears throat> did you tell her about the time of the trial that you were going to write a book, that you had thought about and were going to write a book? I can't remember exactly. I, I think we did have a conversation about a book, possibly, in the future. And did you tell her you're going to write a book because you thought it would make a lot of money? Oh, no, sir. You never said that? No, sir. And did you tell her that you were going to write a book to make a bunch of money so you could buy a lake lot and build a house on it? No, sir. Okay. Now, did you ever tell her uh, that you had given a juror a ride home, that you had accompanied Mr. Bill, what's his last name? Bill Polk. You're right. Did, did you and he took a juror home one night? Did you tell her that? Did you take a juror home one night? I didn't take a juror home one night. Did no, Mr. Sir. Polk, Mr. Polk and you take a juror home one night? No, sir. We didn't. Okay. You never gave a juror a ride in a car with Mr. Polk or without? No, sir. Okay. Um, now, also, during the trial, um, you're your daughter ended up on the venire, is that right? She did. And um, she was coming up, and did you talk to me and, and Mr. Waters about putting her on the jury, if at all possible? I'm not sure that we wanted her to be on the jury, if at all possible, but um, I think the question was, um, would she make a good juror? And I said, she sure, she sure would. Now, I don't think we asked you. I think you told us she would make a great juror, did you not? I remember you asking. Okay, okay. I, was considering putting your daughter on the jury? Yes, sir. And who does she work for? She works for Compass South. Did she work for the Sheriff's Department at some point? No, sir. Okay. Did she work in law enforcement at all? No, sir. Okay. Um, now, let me ask you this. Um, how many jury rooms were there? We have two jury rooms in Colleton. In this trial, how many jury rooms did you have? How two. Many? Okay, so the, the entire jury wasn't together at any one time? They were separated into two rooms? Yes. Okay. And um, did uh, the, when they're separated into uh, two uh, jury rooms like that, are they next door to each other? Are they down the hall from each other? 
What? They are next door to each other. Okay. So, but if you close the door to one, can they hear what's going on in the other one? Some women probably have very good hearing and men too, but I would say probably not. Okay. Are there restrooms in both of the jury rooms? There are. Okay. Where, I mean, are there two restrooms or just one? There's one restroom in each jury room. Okay. Were either one of those uh, restrooms designated men and women, or did everybody use the same one? They were unisex. They were unisex. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, prior to your testimony here today, have you met with uh, the Attorney General's office in SLED? I have. On how many occasions? I want to say twice. Okay. And remember when the first time was? I think the first time was in September. Okay. And the second time was last week? Yes, sir. And that was in Walterboro? Yes, right. And you all spent about four, four and a half hours together? I want to say maybe two hours together. Okay. And in those two hours you went over your testimony here today? They asked me questions. Did they ever correct your answers or suggest you answered differently? Oh, no. No, no. Oh, so no. you just you just went through what you went through in 20 minutes here. It took two hours to go through when you were with them. There were times when I would step out of the room and come back in. Um, but I would say we were there for about two hours. Now, um, you have described in your book your role as Switzerland. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And that is that you should not be in any way um, opinionated about what's going on in the trial. Is that correct? That's true. Okay. Um, yet in your book you indicated a number of different points during the trial you had concluded he was guilty. Is that correct? I think. Your Honor, I have to take this point. I don't know if her conclusions in the book are in any way relevant to what occurred during the trial and whether or not there was any communications with the jurors, which is the sole issue that we're here for today, is whether or not uh, Ms. Hill had any extraneous influence on the jurors. Um, and so I think this is uh, going a little far afield. We object to the relevance here. Let me give you an example. You indicate riding back from Moselle that you and three other people were in a car. And you all decided, adamantly, I think was the word you used, um, that he was guilty, that he had killed his wife and son. Is that what you put in the book? I can't remember if I put that in the book, but if you say I did, then I will did agree that with happen? you. We did have a conversation about what each of us thought. And the all four agreed that he was guilty, correct? And none of us were jurors. No, no, no. trust me, I know that. Um, but you had an abiding conviction, um, at least by the time of the Moselle visit, that he was guilty. And the other people in the car with you were bailiffs, were they not? No. Who um, were they? Some were not bailiffs. One was a court reporter. One was our um, security officer, head security. And another was a deputy sheriff. Okay. But the four of y'all rode out there. And based on what, and I, I mean, I can, you want me to read to you how chilled you were and how you felt this, that poor Paul and, and, and Maggie had been executed by him on that scene, that visiting the scene convinced you that he was a horrible, horrible murderer? You want me to read that to you? Or you will concede that's what you wrote? I will concede that's what I wrote. But if I may, I, will, I would say that, that a lot of that is poetic license um, in writing a book and in well, making it sound like that. Okay, so some of it's poetic license, and some of it you just stole. You 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 uh, purloined it from that BBC writer, right? Right. Again, I object to uh, not only the relevance but the uh, scope uh, cross. I would object also under uh, Rule um, 608. I don't believe that that's appropriate cross examination. Overrule. You may continue, Mr. Harpoon. Did you steal part of the book? I did plagiarize, okay, Mr. Hartfield. That's stealing, isn't it? And it is, okay. and for that, I'm very sorry. And I have apologized. Okay, and that makes it okay. What I did, I did, okay. and I apologized for okay. that. And part of the book is you say literary license, exaggeration. I wouldn't call it exaggeration. Okay. Now let me ask you this: Is Switzerland 
and this is you're saying this is happening while you're supposed to be Switzerland. You've decided the defendant's guilty, and um, if Ms. McElmean says that it's going to make you more money um, if you if he's found guilty, don't you think it's reasonable to assume that you may have crossed the line from time to time? Your Honor, I object to the form of the question, assuming facts are not in evidence. Oguru. Can you repeat that question one more time, I'm Mr. Hartwell? I'm not going to repeat it. Let me just move on to something else. Um, let, let me ask you, um, you had interactions with some jurors, and I believe um, in a conference in the judges chambers, um, you indicated that you had seen a post on, is it Walterboro word of mouth? Your Honor, again, I object. Uh, I think he's delving now into the Facebook inquiry. Uh, we believe, again, that that's irrelevant to the inquiry for Your Honor. I will allow limited, uh, he's, uh, 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 as I understand it, trying to impeach your testimony and uh, 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 explore her credibility. And uh, I think I've already told Mr. Harputlin that I don't want a whole trial about the business of Facebook and the egg juror, but uh, I will allow limited examination on this point. You may proceed, Mr. Harcourt. Am I over oversimplifying that? You, I mean, it's in your book. Um, you saw something on Walter Burr word of mouth, which appeared to you to be from the ex-husband of one of your jurors. Is that correct? Am I oversimplifying that? I remember reading one night something on Walter Burr word of mouth and. When I was in the courtroom on a Monday morning listening to the judge and the attorneys talking about a matter, it sounded like it was relevant to each other. Okay. And um, you became aware somehow that this juror had a restraining order out for her ex-husband? She told me that herself. Okay. And um, uh, tell me how uh, it came for her to tell you about that. Where did she tell you? She uh, was very talkative, and when I was instructed by Judge Newman to go and get her from out of the jury room with a, a deputy following me, she was talking to me all the way back to the judge's chambers, and she mentioned that there were restraining orders out when they had divorced. So how did the judge, who brought it to the judge's attention about this Walterboro word of mouth thing? I let the judge know, thinking that it could be related. Okay, and you let the judge know what? That I had read something on Walter Burr word of mouth. Okay, and that you knew it was tied to that juror? I didn't know that it was. I who, wasn't sure who, at all. Who did you think it was tied to? From what y'all were talking about at the bench, um, I felt like I needed to let him know, just in case it was related. There was something about an ex-husband and an ex-wife and somebody being on the jury. You didn't tell the judge that you had found what we call the apology post? You didn't tell the judge that? I didn't call it that, no. You don't remember producing it saying that, that, that producing it to the judge saying this is a post in which the guy that posted it on Friday night says the devil got in him and he's drinking and he apologized for what he posted? You didn't produce that? My staff did, one of my staff but you. Did gave that to the judge and gave it to us, did you not? Yes, we did. As if it were from that juror's ex-husband, correct? Correct. And you know it wasn't? I don't know that, Mr. Hartbullian, no. So, and this, you did not take that juror out and talk to her before you took her to the judge? Is that I, your I never talked to that juror about stuff like that. Okay. Um, did you ever talk to the forelady of the jury, separate from the jury? I did. Okay. And tell us, uh, where did that occur? When I would go into the jury room and I would speak with the forelady, we would be in, like, the hallway in the, the, the two jury rooms were side by side and the opening to the jury room went out into the hallway and we would be surrounded by the jurors at all times. Oh, Mr. Bill would be very, very nearby or another bailiff as well when we would speak. And what did you speak to her about? There were several instances. One was um, 
there was a juror who needed some feminine products. There was another time when Band-Aids were needed. There were times when uh, Tylenol would be needed. Other than items that were needed by the jury's health object, did you ever discuss, did she ever discuss with you is some issues the jurors had emotionally or some issues with dissension in the jury room? She only told me that there were some loud jurors and it made some of the other jurors a little upset, but other than that, that's... What did, what did you tell her to do? I told her if it got out of hand to write a note to the judge and that she could sign the note and get Mr. Bell to give it to the judge and the judge would handle that for her. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, you did publish a book after, after this trial, is that correct? We did. And you went to New York and took some of the jurors to the Today Show? The, t the Today Show did invite us, yes. Now, one of those jurors um, that went up there with you, the day of the verdict, um, wore, for the first time I can remember, wore a suit to, to court. Do you remember that? Your Honor, again, I would object to discussion of the jurors wearing a suit or a post-trial trip to, uh, to the Today Show. And I don't believe there's any connection to the inquiry that's that's I'm focused for Your Honor, and that is whether or not there was any extraneous influence during the course of the trial. I'm going to connect it, Your Honor, I believe. All right. Overruled. You may continue, Mr. Halperton. Did you text, email, or communicate on the morning before final arguments were completed that to people that they, this was on a Thursday, that they probably, if they're going to see the trial, should come on that Thursday because it would be over by the next day. It would be, the jury would not be out very long. Did you ever communicate that, email, text, or verbally? I do remember saying that, yes. And why did you think the jury would not be out very long? Had you communicated with jurors? I had not communicated with jurors about anything related to this trial at all. I've been a court reporter for at least 14 years. I was clerk of court for three. And you just get to where you kind of um, see things happen as they progress. And it's a guess. It's a gut feeling. And that's, that's all that I meant by that. Well, why are you telling this young man who wanted passes for the next day in an email um, you know, it won't be happening tomorrow. That was your, or did you say, you didn't say, I don't think, you just said, you better come today if you're coming. Do you remember doing that? I don't remember that. Um, but, you know, if, if he wanted to come, I knew that the trial would be ending shortly as far as testimony. So if he wanted to come, he needed to come. Why wouldn't the jury have been out a week on a six week trial? They could have. But, but they could you're, have. you apparently were telling the press and others that would be a quick verdict. Were that, you not? That was a just a gut feeling that I had. Okay. And that was my opinion. <clears throat> Your opinion, you were right. The jury was out three hours on a six week trial, correct? That's true. How much money did you make off that book? There was not a whole lot of money made off of the book after paying different things and um, paying for some expenses that went along with that. But I want to say roughly around 100000 Okay. That's not a lot of money. No, especially when you publish your own book. But that was 100000 you made? Uh, with my co-author. Okay. In, in what period of time? Six months? I would say six months, yes. When was the book published? August 1st. Okay. The um, trial was over. That's uh, six months after the trial's over, you've published a book, correct? Correct. And then uh, I believe you've recently stopped selling the book because of the plagiarism you've admitted to, correct? Correct. And so there's no more money? Correct. Now, um, you also indicate in the book that the Murdaws had a reputation of um, criminality, I think, is kind of what you put. Did you not? Well, Mr. Hartpooley and my grandfather and Old Man Buster were very close. Well, were they criminals? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But you I believed and you published that the, Mur the Murdaugh family had run that part of the state 
and they participated in criminal conduct, correct? Your Honor, again, I would object to general testimony about the alleged criminality of this family. I, I'm not sure how that has any bearing on the focused inquiry before the court. He's asking by, about what she said in the book. I'm going to allow it. Yes, sir. Did you say that in the book, that they, they were criminals? In the book, that was more of the, the literary ease that we, that we take, I think, to make a story a little more interesting for the reader. By calling people criminals. I guess what I'm saying is this. Were they criminals? Your Honor, again, I object to that particular question. Oh, Ruth. Were they criminals? I wouldn't know that. Okay, so know. you either made it up or you're lying about it? About the reputation of people that can't defend themselves? They're dead? You're going to call them criminals? You did that in the book so you could sell a book? No, I didn't do that to sell a book. What would you do it for? Made it more readable, you said? It, Which liter sells literary books. Literary ease. Yeah. What? Literary. Literary what? Uh, the, the literary ease that, that you can take with when writing a book. Literary ease you can take with writing a book? You can make stuff up? You can lie? You can lie about not people? With, not with that. I, I, you know, it's, I think the public perception uh, was one that it was very interesting during this time. So and you're feeding... You're feeding the monster out there that wants to believe bad things about the Murdoch's and you'll make stuff up to do it. Let me give you another example. During, I read your book and I found this somewhat humorous, my co-counsel did not, uh, in describing Mr. M myself and Mr. Griffin. In the book you say that um, I neutered him. Um, we've both been very con interested in what you meant by that. What do you mean by I mean, neutering Jim Griffin? Mr. Hartpoolian, it, it was a book. Did you make it up? I know it was a book. The right. Bible's a book. Right. I mean, just because it's a book doesn't mean you can lie in it. It's, it's just a word right. that was argument used. Make sure that exchange. Uh, don't argue with the witness, but the witness, uh, Ms. Hill, you're instructed to answer his questions. You may proceed, Mr. Harper. So let me get this straight. The book, and I'll see if I can cut to the chase on this. I could read you chapter after chapter, verse after verse, which is not true. Okay? Not true based on my experience of being in a courtroom and not true based on knowing some of the people you described. Okay. You say you say that hey, is... Mr. Harputin. I object. The counsel is just testifying right now as to his observations about the book. Question, Mr. Harputin, please. You have conceded there are things in the book that you don't know to be true, correct? Correct. Okay. You would concede then that you have lied in the book. It's only because I wasn't there at the time. I can't... I can't um, interview my dead grandfather. I can't interview Mr. Buster. There's just things that we can't um, interview them on. We can go by what was written in a newspaper and get facts from that. And, and take the inference that uh, one of the Murdoch's was a pedophile. You could have printed that, and they're not here to contradict it. You could have printed anything you wanted and made it up to sell books. That's what this, this whole scheme was about, selling books. As you told Rhonda McElveen, if, he, if, if him being found guilty would sell more books. Your Honor, Isn't that I, true? I'd yeah. object to the argument of the nature of the question, the compound question, and assuming facts not yeah, a compound question. Uh, if what you're asking is what uh, she told uh, Ms. McElveen, go on and ask that, but don't precede it with a yes, uh, Your Honor. testimony. Beg the court's indulgence for just a moment. something we now know probably wasn't her ex-husband. Um, did she have any other ex-husbands that you found out about? I have no idea. Well, you wrote 
We learned later the ex-spouses hadn't seen each other in 14 years and she had three restraining orders against him. Did, did she have three restraining orders against him? I don't know. That's what she said. Okay. Um, Did you tell jurors at the end of the trial after President's Day break? President's Day break would have been a Monday, correct? Correct. But before Mr. Murdoch testified, did you tell the jury not to be fooled by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's lawyers? Mr. Harpooley and I never talked to the jurors about any of the evidence. Okay, the answer in this would case. be yes or no, then you can explain. Did you say that? No. Okay. Um, did you, all, did you ever instruct the jury to watch him closely immediately before he testified, looking at his actions, looking at his movements? Did you ever tell a jury to do that? No. Did you ever tell the jury to pay attention to Mr. Murdoch's testimony? To pay attention, not specifically to his testimony. I did tell the jury to pay attention. Um, to what? Just generally in the hallway when I was speaking. Not to him? No. Just any witness. Right. Okay. Um, did you did you ever warn the jurors the defense is about to do their side? This is right before uh, right at the, the beginning of the defense case. They are going to say things that will try to confuse you. Don't let them confuse you or convince you or throw you off. Did you ever tell the jury that? No, sir. Okay. Um, did you ever tell the jury, if you get emotional, we want to see your face, because that is what they want to see? Did you ever tell them that? No, sir. Um, did you ever tell the jury that Mr. Uh, Murdoch was about to testify? I didn't tell the jurors that. Now, did you tell the jury that if they didn't reach a verdict by 10 o'clock, they were going to have to spend the night? No, sir, I did not. Did you ever tell them they were going to have to spend the night at no, some sir. point? No, sir. Did you ever tell them that they couldn't smoke? No, sir. Okay. You got any other books in the works? No, sir. I mean, doesn't this make a good book? Yes, sir. Matters that came up on cross, obviously, that I'd objected to. Um, I, you won't wait here, client. You, you, you may reserve your rights to object to the entire line of testimony, but you may offer cross examination subject to the assertion of your objection about the testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, one of the things you were asked about is uh, finding <clears throat> this Facebook post and you brought that to the court's attention after a different issue had already arisen related to a, a juror is that correct correct all right and are you technically capable of manufacturing a Facebook post is that anything that you have any capability to do I'm not all right and did you uh, ask your staff member to go see if she could find this post I did did you tell her just generally what you recalled reviewing yes and did she did you give her any further instruction other than that no were you sitting behind her as she was doing this particular search or anything like that or did she eventually report back to you she is very very techy and then she reported back to me 
All right, so you weren't there when she was searching anything like that? No. And she was like, I couldn't find that post, but I did find this and handed you the Facebook post. Is correct. that correct? Correct. And then you provided that to Judge Newman and ultimately to the, it was provided to the parties. Is that correct? Right. Correct. You were asked about conversations uh, that you had with the forelady. Did those in involve logistical issues and things like that the for the jury? The conversations with the forelady was to everything. There was nothing in regarding the defendant and this trial. All right. So they were logistical issues, not anything to do with the substance of the trial. Is that Absolutely. Correct? Yes. You were asked about whether or not you had texted some people, uh, this won't be long. Was that at all in, in any way based on any conversation you had with a juror uh, in, as to their internal thinking or anything like that? Or was that oh, just your, your, your assessment being an experienced person in the court? Absolutely not. It was based on just your assessments? Just my assessments, yes. Did you ever communicate with the jurors on how long they would be, or did any juror ever tell you how long they thought they would be? I never talked to any jurors about anything like that. You were asked about your book, and, and I don't want to get into too much detail about that, but you were asked about some of the assertions that you made in the book, and you were asked if these were lies. Were they lies, or were they ultimately things that were based on inferences from newspapers and community Objection stories? Lady. All uh, right, you are leading by, this is your witness, Mr. Uh, Waters, so please ask a direct question. Okay. Thank you. Was your, some of the statements that you were asked about in your book, were they lies or were they based on your inferences from just general community knowledge and things that you had researched and knew? Still leading, but I'm not going to object. All right. He's right about that, Mr. Waters. Just ask a direct question. <laughs> Did you lie in your book? No, I did not. Thank you. You were asked about um, when you told the jury to pay attention. When you asked that question, did you also mention anything about we got coffee for you or things like that? I knew that Mr. Bill would take care of that. And the, the jurors knew too. Um, coffee, we had done some Dunkin' Donut runs. We had provided coffee, different other things to help stay awake in the cold courtroom that we were found ourselves in and so I knew anything that they needed Mr. Bill would see that they got because that's what he did. At any time did you have any conversation with any juror in which you tried to influence their decision? I did not have a conversation with any juror about anything related to this case. All right, Ms. Hill, I want you to turn your attention to a hearing that Judge Newman had uh, about the alternate who was uh, dismissed, uh, sometimes called the egg juror. Do you recall that hearing? Yes, ma'am. In the hearing, Judge Newman expressed his uh, unhappiness with you for questioning that juror before he questioned her. Do you recall that? I do remember seeing that. Well, then let's go back and talk about that juror. Uh, you, on uh, examination in this courtroom, you sa said that she, she talked about a lot of things to you, but you didn't uh, ask her any questions. But that's not completely accurate, is it? Yes, ma'am, that is true. Well, you asked, you asked her direct questions, uh, uh, and that came out in the uh, hearing that Judge Newman had. You asked her questions before she was even examined by the judge, did you not? Your Honor, I, I did not ask her any questions.
the juror was examined by the judge uh, in a hearing. Do you recall that hearing? So it's the second hearing on this matter. I do recall that hearing, yes. And <coughs> the court Asked you about the, the court asked this juror about postings on Facebook, did he not? Correct. And the juror said she, she gave Miss Be Becky my full access to my Facebook. Uh, and I put positive po posts on it. I've done that for the past three years. Do you recall her testifying in that regard? I do remember reading that. And the okay. judge said, has anyone posted anything on Facebook about you? And the juror answered, I was not aware of it until Miss Becky told me today. Do you recall that? I do remember her saying that. And do you recall the judge saying, what did she tell me? And the juror said, she asked me if I had an ex-husband, and I said, yeah. Did you ask her that? I remember her saying this, Your Honor. But I did not ask her any of these questions. And she further says, she asked me if I had talked to him about the case or being on jury duty, and I said no. I had questioned her about why she was asking me that. I haven't seen my husband since 2014. Do you recall her testifying to that? I do remember that, yes. And with that, uh, having jarred your memory, do you recall asking her about her husband and his post? Your Honor, I don't remember saying anything about that. Well, what was the post that you read in the Walterboro um, uh, uh, Word, Word of Mouth? What, what, what was the nature? You read that, uh, did you not? I did. What did it say? Uh, my memory is a little fuzzy with that, but it was about a ex-husband who found out that his ex-wife was on a jury and he didn't think that she would be a good juror and it just sounded very similar to what i had heard the judge and the attorneys speaking so about. you then went to that juror and questioned her about that did you not i did not your honor well she says in this testimony that she didn't know about the facebook until miss becky told me was she what was that incorrect I'm not some saying kind of some kind of conversation went between the two of her for her to know about that post, correct? That's true. And I'm thinking that it could have been someone, um, it wasn't me. I just know that it's not me that she talked to about that. Well, when the judge, um, the, the judge was uh, questioning uh, the juror about this, uh, She also said that she had three restraining orders against him. Uh, and she also said, uh, I was very upset after she told me that. I have, like I said, I have three restraining orders against him, and I wouldn't have anything to do with him if I didn't have a child with him. But I haven't seen him since 2014. She didn't, y'all didn't discuss that, the restraining orders? On the way from the jury from the uh, jury room to the um, back chambers where the judge was, she was very um, scared. She was talking about the the three restraining orders that she had out on her husband at the time that they were divorcing, and she was scared that he would be trying to get back in contact with her again. Well, how she, do you know that? Did she tell you that? She was talking about that on the way to the jury room uh, to the chambers with the judge. And in the court, in, in, in this hearing now that I'm looking at, uh, that the court is conducting, she said, they're asking about this Facebook post, and she said, Miss Becky said she went, had went to look for the post again and that it had been deleted. I don't know 
who she talked to or anything else, but she said apparently, do you recall her saying that? I do remember her saying that. And the court then said, what did she tell you about that? And the juror said, it was after you let us go on the last break, I was very upset. This is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And she came down and talked to me and said that apparently, I don't know who talked to him, but he, he said he was drunk and he removed the post. Do you recall that? I, uh, well, she didn't tell me that, and I didn't talk with her about that. Well, I, you saw that post, the so-called apology post, did you not? Right, I did. And you assumed that was a post from her husband, did you not? Right. And then you talked to the juror about that, did you not? I did not talk with the juror about that. Well, who did you talk to about it? Did you bring it to the judge's attention? No, we didn't get a chance to talk to the judge about that. The, ju the court asked this juror, has the clerk discussed anything about the case with anyone on the jury? The juror said, not that I'm aware of. The judge said, okay, she was just discussing with juror. She pulled me aside when we went downstairs after the last break. I want to say it was after lunch, and we came back, and that's when she first told me about it, about this, what we now know was a not a post from her husband. Right. But you assumed it was a post at the time, and y'all had a conversation about it, correct? Don't just nod, ask, answer the question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe that it was one of my staff that she talked to, and but it was not me that she talked to. And But the juror says, and I want to say it was after lunch we came back, and that's when she first told me about it. She's talking about you. Correct. Then we went back into the court, and I never even got to sit on the jury. The judge says, uh, the judge then stops the questioning and she exits the room. Uh, Mr. Griffin, Your Honor, I think that satisfies it. She hadn't talked to anybody, hadn't expressed an opinion, hadn't made up an opinion. She's got an ex-husband and she has three restraining orders against him. The court said, Ms. Mr. Waters, just obviously we're all invested in this. My main concern, I certainly would love to, but not love to, but would want to hear, you know, what one of these individuals said, but you know, she answered the questions as she did, talking about the juror. All right. They then uh, have a colloquy about uh, this juror and whether this was really her husband that put this post in that you talked to her about and apparently talked to the court about at some point, am I right? That's right. And then at the end, the judge said that he was uh, not too happy with your having talked to the juror before you talked to him. Do you recall the judge saying that? Yes, ma'am, I do. And did you pop right up there and uh, say what you're saying now, that you never talked to her? We never talked about it after that. I wasn't in the room when he said that. The judge brought up another thing right after sentencing that I want to explore with you briefly. Okay. Uh, one of the big responsibilities of the clerk of court is to take control of the exhibits that are presented in court. Isn't that correct? Yes, ma'am. And there were sealed exhibits presented in this uh, uh, case uh, that were photographs uh, of uh, the two decedents uh, 
at Moselle uh, when the uh, law enforcement authorities first investigated the murders. You recall that? Yes, ma'am. And those photographs were sealed by the judge, were they not? Correct. And when the uh, testimony about them was completed, they were under your control as the clerk of court, were they not? That's correct. How was it that those photographs came into public view? Are you talking about after the... I'm um, talking about the, the fact he, he alluded to it on sentencing uh, and said that uh, he was frustrated about it and was going to try to look into it. Uh, those photographs that were sealed court exhibits under your control found their way into the public media, did they not? I believe they did. Um, and I think what happened, it was um, someone from the gallery took a picture from a screen that had some of the pictures on it, if I'm remembering correctly. Did you ever allow anyone from the press to view these sealed exhibits? No, ma'am. Did you allow Netflix to ever uh, examine the exhibits for trial? No, ma'am. How did you handle exhibits? Because you did uh, have the press have great access to the exhibits, and you say uh, uh, several times in your book that you had to stay after to be sure that you interacted with the press about these exhibits. Uh, that's true, is it not? That is true. We, if we had um, Mr. Jay Bender, and then we had the, the um, pool photographers and someone from uh, maybe the state, I believe, or the posting courier, along with the court reporters, someone from court administration, and then someone from the clerk's office every night that would go over the exhibits to make sure everything was correct and in, within our domain. Were any uh, press people ever allowed to view the exhibits, even the sealed exhibits uh, that you had on file? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What was the methodology for uh, allowing them to uh, examine the exhibits? How did you handle that? I wasn't there a whole lot with when we did this every night, um, but it's my understanding that the people that were involved with the exhibits and especially the court reporters um, and there was a certain time frame that they were allowed to take their pictures and everything was um, all, the, all of the pictures were looked at by the court reporters that were there and the lady from court administration along with someone from my office and Mr. J. Bender to make sure that everything was done correctly. What I'm asking is how you handled having them, the press, view these exhibits. If I remember correctly, the press, we had certain designated um, photographers and then someone, I think, from the state of the, or the Post and Courier, and they were responsible for putting it out to, on a stream for the rest of the media to and access. And would they do that by photographing the exhibits as they were in your possession after court was over that day? That is correct. All right. And how did you handle the sealed exhibits in terms of uh, their availability when these press people are there photographing the exhibits? They stayed sealed. And so you think that the, the you're aware of the fact that some of these uh, uh, on the scene uh, photographs of the two decedents found their way into the public press. You're aware I'm, of that, are you not? Yes, ma'am, I am, yes. And you contend that they photographed them uh, in the courtroom? That is what I heard. All right. Finally, I, 
you had indicated about your book that some things that you put in there were, you called it literary license, not literally true, correct? Correct. Did you ever, by any kind of email communication or, or in any way, shape, or form, uh, indicate uh, or state that uh, you wanted a guilty verdict because it would increase the sales of, book, of the book. Did you ever say that in an email or verbally or in any other way? No, ma'am, I did not. It didn't matter to me if it was guilty, not guilty, or a mistrial. Well, in your book, you suggest that uh, the guilty verdict was what you wanted and you were fearful that, the, uh, that a guilty verdict would not be rendered. You say that a lot about your feeling about wanting a guilty verdict, do you not? I do agree that that is said in the book. And, and part of that is because I think it was a guilty verdict. Um, well, this is way that you were describing a time way before the verdict was rendered. Uh, when you wrote about those things in the book. Isn't that correct? It is, yes. And you even have something where you say that your eyes met with jurors and others at Moselle and y'all had an understanding, unspoken, uh, that he was guilty. You said that in the book, did you not? I did say that in the book and I would consider that part of the literary, um, the word that we just said, um, but that, that was, there was nothing spoken with a juror at all at Moselle or anywhere else at the courthouse or anywhere. Um, I think that was, that's, that's part of that poetic license that, that we write to make something more apparent. But at no time did I read or try to read someone else's eyes and um, that was just one of those gut feelings that that I wrote in the book. You wrote at a, in the book, speaking of a time before the ju jury verdict was rendered, I was conflicted about knowing the Murdoch family and about having so many people watching and listening to me as I read the verdict. I was mostly concerned about Alex being found innocent when I knew in my heart he was guilty. I had this fear that the goodwill the Murdochs had built up in the community would influence the jury. Uh, you wrote that, did you not? Yes, ma'am. So you had those feelings well before the verdict was announced in this case. You had some definite opinions and feelings about what the verdict should be, did you not? I did have a certain way that I felt. But that I wasn't never... any, that, that's not any poetic license, what was said there. That's how you felt, correct? Correct. All right. Those are my questions. Uh, anything further from, from the state, Mr. Waters? questions about uh, the interactions during the, uh, the in-camera proceedings with the juror who was excluded. Uh, were you in the room during the entirety of those interactions or just were brought in here or there as, as those occurred? No, I was only brought in for my asking of my questions from Judge Newman. And you were asked a little bit about uh, sealed exhibits and uh, about Judge Newman's comments at sentencing at the end of trial. And just to clarify, uh, those were not um, 
pictures of any sealed exhibits, it was uh, a picture that someone had taken in the gallery that had actually been disclosed, and that's what Judge Newman was talking about, to your understanding? That was my understanding, yes. And then after the trial, uh, there was uh, even a, a post-trial hearing or some discussion about the fact that the some body cam videos had not been sealed, and Judge Newman fixed that problem after the trial. Is that correct? Correct. Nothing further, Your Honor. Just a couple questions. Mr. Harper, mm -hmm. um, let me understand this correctly. You would agree that you did release um, all of the exhibits in this case, sealed and unsealed, to the Texas film crew. Is that correct? No, sir. Hmm? No, sir. I did not release the, the sealed exhibits. What about to, to, um, to Netflix? Didn't you indicate to the judge they'd been mistakenly released and you were getting them back? As an error, before when we realized everything, yes, those two did go, and Netflix had not even, uh, they said they had not even looked at them. Did you get them back? We did get them back, yes. And what about a Japanese film crew? Did they get exhibits, the sealed exhibits? They did not get any sealed ex exhibits. What about NBC Universal? No sealed exhibits. But you do concede that Netflix did get sealed exhibits? They did it as an error. It wasn't Who's listed. Error? Well, I would say the court reporter didn't mark it on the, on the listing. Well, why were you in such, why were you so accommodating to these national documentary uh, folks? I mean, is this good for the book? I mean, the, the more documentaries out there about the Murdoch thing, the better your book sales are? I mean, it was, there was money in this for you, right? Again, it's about the money, right? What's your question now? There's Isn't it financially beneficial to you at the time to get more of these photographs out, more publicity, more Netflix, more HBOs, more Japanese? Doesn't that sell books for you? Didn't you see a financial advantage? Not at all. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Uh, Ms. Hill, you may step down. Let, let, let's uh, hang on for a moment. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Is she excused for subpoena? I just wanted to make sure she's not excused oh, well, for I, I, I want her to step down. Yes, she's still under subpoena. I, I, I haven't heard whatever what's going to be said. Mr. Harputnian still has some things he wants to raise about other witnesses and so forth. So what I would prefer is that uh, she remain with you, Mr. Lewis, uh, until we see what else is going to happen. You may step down. All right, Mr. Harpootlian. Um, <clears throat> Your Honor, we've got literally millions of pages of documents in this case. Um, Ms. Miller just uncovered an email relevant to what you asked. Um, we don't have it printed out. Um, but what it is is an email from Rebecca Hill to Miho Takahuchi, Takachuchi, something. Um, Miho, first names, the Buford McDowell body cam should not have gone to you. Please get rid of it. Do not use it. The judge, Judge Newman, specifically ordered that body cam not be used if it got out. Apparently, it's still on the videos we were saved. I appreciate your attention. Um, what about the he right back? What about the other body cam video? We could we could see on many news documentaries. Can you provide it? It seems the camera was on the other police personnel. I mean, here she's having emails between this Japanese production company about body cams telling them not and telling them to get rid of it. I think that's important um, and I can have a copy of this printed out for you when we can get it to a printer for you for the record. Uh, that would be fine but uh, uh, do you want to offer it as an exhibit? I do. All right Mr. Waters. I have no objection if I could just ask the date of that. Um, the date is July 17th, 2023. July, yeah, July. All right, that, that's uh, one thing. Uh, what else? Um, I, will, I, I will admit it. I will allow it. 
uh, that uh, that was that that is a uh, impeachment of her testimony to me that she did not send any emails from, uh, yes, uh, or release anything. Yes, In fact, she she changed that testimony on redirect when she said she did so-called by accident release some things. That, that doesn't appear to be by accident. Um, so we'd like that made part of the record. Secondly, I have sitting outside the courtroom the clerk of court for Barnwell County, Rhonda McElveen. She specifically denied saying certain things to the clerk of court of Barn did. Barnwell County and denied doing certain things. I think you're going to uh, find her testimony extraordinarily instructive and educational. I, and it shouldn't take, I would be shocked if it took 20 minutes. This well, in light of the answers she gave to my questions uh, uh, and some of yours uh, in that regard, I'm going to allow it. Now, I want to know what else we're looking at here. Um, do we have only one copy of this? You have the Your Honor, I want to hand up to you an affidavit from a witness we would propose to provide in addition to, in addition to um, the clerk of court. This is a, a alternate juror, not the egg lady. This is the alternate juror who was dismissed when she was not needed for deliberations. And she is here also ready to testify. testimony would take about the same time as one of those jurors this morning. Sir? I would expect her testimony would take about as much time as one of those jurors this morning. This is your offer uh, in uh, refutation of the testimony Ms. Hill has given today. She denied saying any she of She denies this. saying anything. That's correct. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Now, is this... Uh, is this juror, uh, alternate juror, going to testify? She's here. Yes, yes, Your Honor. She's uh, sitting. Uh, well, you just say she's here. She's available. Yes, ma'am. All right, all right, Mr. Waters. Uh, Your Honor, a couple things uh, on this particular alternate juror. Uh, we've just been handed uh, this particular uh, affidavit. Um, Your Honor, uh, I believe uh, that Your Honor had correctly ruled that the focus again was on those jurors and the inquiry has been made to those particular jurors. Uh, I don't know why we would go into detail with an alternate juror that ultimately did not uh, sit in any deliberations and cannot uh, testify as to any effect on the verdict, which is the ultimate inquiry before Your Honor. Um, and so we would, we would object to uh, this particular testimony uh, as far as it relates to the alternate juror. Um, Here's, here's the one thing that gives me some heartburn, and you can help me with this, please. Uh, I stand by uh, the rulings I have made that um, uh, only jurors can be uh, questioned about the effect on, on their verdict. Uh, and uh, that is why I did not allow the testimony of the egg juror uh, in that regard. Uh, you and he is now offering this testimony uh, and it's testimony of certain things that were said to the jurors as a whole rather than just to this particular juror. Uh, and uh, I would, as I say, I would ordinarily not allow this, but Ms. Hill uh, testified several times uh, uh, during the course of her uh, uh, just concluded appearance that she never told any jurors anything along the lines of what has been uh, 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 asked here, particularly from uh, uh, the comments about uh, they're going to say things that will try to confuse you or throw you off, things of that nature. She, she was asked about that, and she denied she ever said anything like that. So this is an attempt to impeach, impeach as I see it. And uh, 
that's what's giving me a little heartburn about just turning him down flat. Well, a couple things to add to that, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, um, I, I think that we have some very specific statements and a specific individual that's mentioned here. And so if we're looking at Rule 613, uh, B, which is where, essentially where they're operating, I don't know that there was an appropriate foundation laid as to the specific time and, and to whom these specific statements were made. I, I, I think that it needed to be cleaner with regards to that as to, you know, mentioning this particular person and uh, as much as you can the time and place and the very specific statements that were made. Uh, I, I think Mr. Harpooley and again, we had these general allegations and kind of went through those, but I don't know that what, now that we've just been handed this affidavit, uh, that they were uh, set forth as, uh, as an appropriate clarity that's required by 613B. So I think there's a failure there. Mr. Waters, look for a minute at paragraph three, uh, four, five, six, seven, uh, those paragraphs uh, all uh, address things that have been asked her, and they are pretty specific as to time and place. And this, they, the, the content of this uh, testimony is an attempt to impeach her, uh, Ms. Hill's testimony. That's, that's why I, uh, uh, as, as I guess colloquially I said, I'm having a little heartburn about excluding this, is because she was asked directly about these matters, uh, and the, this testimony would be in conflict with that, which would be permitted to impeach someone. Right, and Your Honor, I, I certainly understand the point. I guess I would have just two points to that. Number one um, is that, as we've already talked about, uh, this evidentiary hearing is, is, is within your discretion in the manner, particularly when you're talking about jurors in the manner to be conducting that. Now we're talking about putting a juror on the stand and having attorney examination. And I think under the case law, that's within your discretion as to how that inquiry should go as opposed to uh, it, were we purely in a trial setting and, and applying the evidentiary rules. But if we were applying the evidentiary rules, again, uh, strictly applied, I think that I don't know that they have laid the foundation with enough clarity to offer extrinsic evidence under 613B, and that would be our argument there, that we just had generally discussion of some of these concepts, but not the place, time, and person to whom it was made uh, with the specificity that 613B uh, requires. So that would be our evidentiary objection in the event that Your Honor is, is, uh, is addressing those. Um, so that would be our position. I, I do also, uh, before we get started, I, I do want to go back and address the sealed exhibits issue um, whenever it's appropriate. Sure, um, sure, sure. If, sure. If, if now I'm happy to go. Um, Mr. Harpootlin, uh, no, slow for a minute. Mr. I'm turning to Mr. Waters to try to get some clarity about why he objects to this testimony. One is the 613 issue that he's explored, and I understand that. He now wants to say something about the sealed exhibits. Uh, so I want to hear from him on that, and then you can reply to both of them. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm That's all right. Distracted by Mr. Barber. Sure, I understand. And, and you know, finally, going back to the juror issue, we would also uh, raise 403 as well, just because of the nature of the inquiry that we're here uh, to assess. Uh, going back to the sealed exhibits, I just want to clarify uh, for your honor, Mr. Uh, Griffin and Mr. Harpooley, and we're at this uh, hearing. Uh, after the trial, uh, there was a release of, and these were publicly filed exhibits, of a number of exhibits. What also got released at the time were two body cam exhibits which had images of the victims at the scene. Uh, those had inadvertently not been marked as sealed exhibits and ultimately then we had a hearing in front of Judge Newman and essentially those were clawed back. And so I just want to be clear that when, uh, when we're having testimony about that particular thing uh, as it relates to what Ms. Hill was saying, uh, that that was what was, those were the sealed exhibits that were released. And, and again, at the time they had not been marked sealed and that was sort of retroactively uh, uh, fixed. And then the other issue, of course, is, Your Honor, um, is, is again that the issue that Judge Newman was talking about after sentencing was a gallery photo. It was not a uh, what apparently would be a, you know, maybe a press photo, photo of the exact exhibits. And what we did at trial, and Mr. Harpoolian can speak to this, and Mr. Bender could as well, is at the end of each day, first of all, the sealed exhibits would have a cover sheet or a folder that they would be in, and then uh, they would verify with the parties that these are the, these are the okay exhibits, these are the sealed exhibits, and then at that point, after court was concluded, uh, the media would then be allowed to review and or photograph or get copies of the unsealed exhibits. So. 
Uh, that's just uh, how the procedure was working uh, no, at the trial. That, that's very helpful to clarify this because uh, I now see this in perspective that there, uh, there were um, that the uh, materials that uh, were photographs at the scene or depictions at the scene of the two victims. Uh, what you're telling me is that those were inadvertently released after the trial uh, by, I guess by the, well, it would have to be by the clerk of court, she's the one that had them. And then they were, uh, and they weren't properly marked. And That's they right. were then clawed back. Yeah, they were the two body cam videos. Um, and so in those videos, it weren't, it weren't physical images, but they were the body cam uh, videos. And then in those videos, you could see uh, the victims at the scene. Right. And those two exhibits, to my recollection, were the only two that should have been sealed but they, in fairness, were not marked sealed, and that's how they got released. The second we realized it was a problem, we took care of it and, and clawed those back. Well, that, so. that clarifies that issue for me. So, uh, I, I, frankly, that puts my mind at ease about what happened there. Now, uh, Mr. Harputin, and I come to you momentarily. Uh, anything else? No, ma'am, Your Honor. Okay, now, Mr. Harputin. Uh, a couple of things I'd I, 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 I point out. Uh, the first is this, in terms of uh, the statement by this alternate juror. She was interviewed by Sweat on video, said exactly the same thing as she's saying in this affidavit uh, weeks if not months ago. So uh, they know exactly what she said. I can assume they reviewed it. I, by the way, I asked, um, basically read from this affidavit as I, I cross-examined um, the court and uh, she denied each one of these statements. Um, the, the second piece of that is this. I, I know. It's on that basis that I'm even pursuing the idea of uh, your offering something by way of impeachment. So I understand that. And, and secondly, <clears throat> um, as to the sealed exhibits, um, I think we're going to hear testimony from Ms. McElveen that may elaborate on your concerns uh, based on our interview with her this morning. All right. Well, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, it's uh, about uh, three minutes of three, uh, which is when I generally take my afternoon break. Uh, I'm going to uh, adjourn the court or recess the court, uh, and we come back at 3.15, uh, and I will allow you uh, to offer Ms. McElveen uh, and uh, the uh, alternate. Uh, I want to make it clear that the 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 they will be offered on what we've talked about, matters about which Ms. Hill testified that you think are impeached by Ms. McElveen's testimony and that you think are impeached by uh, the alternate juror's testimony. So it's, it, it, and the alternate juror's testimony as I look at it is uh, uh, the part that would, that about which uh, impeachment would lie would begin at paragraph three. Yes, ma'am. So do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Can I make you one other offer? Yes, sir. Today and today only. Egg lady is across the street. Well, uh, and, I, and no, no, no. If you want to put her on the stand. No, no. I, I, I'm just, I've made my position quite clear about that. I think we've got in the record what is needed in terms of uh, uh, what she says, Ms. Hill says, and what Ms. Hill says she says. I, I agree. We did not intend on calling her. I just didn't want you to miss the opportunity if you wanted the uh, opportunity to uh, examine her. All right. Thank you, Mr. Harpoon. All right. Call will be in recess until 3.15.
Please be seated. Mr. Harpootlian, I believe uh, it's uh, you uh, to present your witness. Yes, ma'am. Please be. Uh, Rhonda McElveen. Please have a seat on the witness stand. State your full name for the record, and please spell your first and last name. Rhonda McElveen, R-H-O-N-D-A-M-C-E-L-V-E-E-N. I'm going to make sure I'm going to stay here. <coughs> yes, sir. Please, so I can make sure I can hear you. Rhonda McElveen. Your Honor, can you hear? Okay. I, I can't hear you. Great, Dick. I can hear you, but uh, I, I, I would doubt that anybody post the uh, lawyers better? would hear you. Is that better? No. Is that thing on, Mr. Uh, Bailey? I think it's the mic for the other courtroom. Let me. It's the mic for the next door. I don't want to get into the thing going. <laughs> well, I can speak up. Haywire, I, I'll just speak up. How about that? I, can, I have a big voice. I'll use it. It's just not on at all, though. No, it's on. Is it on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, all right, Mr. Harpooley, you may proceed. I'll speak a little louder if that helps. Say your name again for the record, please. Rhonda McElveen. And Ms. McElveen, what do you do for a living? Clerk of Court and ROD for Barnwell County. Clerk of Court in what? Register of Deeds. I have two titles. Two titles. And is that an appointed or an elected position? Elected. So you're elected by the people of Barnwell County? Yes, sir. And how long have you been the Corker Court of Barnwell County? This is my 16th year. 16 years. And, and I'm uh, running again, sir. <laughs> you're up this year? 24 is? Yes, sir. All right. I don't think I'm allowed to plug that, but um, you um, have been the Cork for 16 years. You're up again this year. Now, do you know uh, the clerk of, um, well, back up for just a second. Do you hold any position with, is there a state organization of clerks of court? Yes, sir. I'm actually the president of the South Carolina Clerks of Court and Register of Deeds. Okay. And that means that of the 46, there are 46 of y'all, is that yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. And you were elected to be the chairman of that group? President of that group president of that group yes sir now um, do the do, are there certain rules and 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 constraints that corks should operate under in terms of dealing with juries yes sir and um, is there training for that or is there a book for that or how do you learn that you have the clerk of court manual for one that's on the judicial website you also have the, the law books that have it in there there's um, actually two um, separate forms SCCA 237 and 238 maybe that has regulations on it and then we also have in the handbook that or not handbook but in the program within the CMS system they actually have rules and stuff there you can go by as well. Now as a clerk of court um, are part of your duties to deal with juries 
Yes, sir. To, 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 once, I mean, we, we understand there's a jury venire that's brought in the beginning of a term, and then individual juries are picked for both civil and criminal cases. Is that correct? That is correct, unless it's a non-jury trial. And then there's just a judge, like we're doing here, right? Yes, sir. And um, in the process of picking juries, do you assist as clerk of court, when I say assist, who, who actually um, picks, the, picks the jurors out of a hat or however, whatever the process is? Well, actually, the first process is you draw a jury by computers through the CMS system, and then summons are sent out. And then once we come to court, we usually do a roll call. We see what everybody's doing, what their jobs and everything, to help the attorneys to decide which jurors they would like to hit. They have so many strikes, et cetera. And then you call the names, and they have the strikes, and then that's that's your jury pool. And, and then the, the, the judge will seat a jury in a jury box, like, although I've never quite seen a jury box that looks like that, but a jury box in a courtroom, right? That is correct. Your jury box in Barnwell County is a little, like two rows of seven or eight people. Well, I actually have a jury box on both sides of, of the courtroom because I have the grand jury on one side when they convene, and then I have the pettit juries on the other side when they convene. Okay. And um, the jury, they're sworn by the judge, and then they're put in the jury box, and they begin to hear arguments and testimony and jury charges by the judge. Is that correct? Well, actually, sir, where we do it, that, the clerk of court usually swears them in with the judge presiding over the whole deal. Okay. <clears throat> Once that jury is sworn in, what is your role in terms of dealing with those jurors individually or as a group? Are you allowed uh, to talk to them individually, to pull them out, to, to converse with them about your opinion about the case? To pull them out of the trial while we're going on? Yes, ma'am. No, sir, we're not. Um, if they're on a break, et cetera, or if they request to see someone, then we manage to, I'll, actually I'll go with the door open I, and I'll say, which one of you needs to see someone who might be the judge? And I said, hold on, and then I go get my judge. And so we've got a juror that needs to speak with you. Do you converse with jurors about the merits of the case, by the merits, uh, whether uh, someone's guilty or innocent, or whether a plaintiff or a defendant should win in a civil case? Do you ever do that? No, sir, about the most only thing I ever do is go in and count them and tell them I can count up to 14 without even using my toes. <laughs> and then I might get their lunch order. That's it. And the doors are usually open when I'm doing that. And you have bailiffs that sit with the jury or sit outside the jury they room? They sit outside the jury room, and usually there's one beside them in the courtroom in case somebody needs something. But usually I, I'm, they'll catch my eye or they'll catch the judge's eye, and we'll get something handled. Okay. So did you have, a, <clears throat> have any contact with the clerk of court of Carlton County <clears throat> prior to her being elected the clerk of court of Carlton County? Did you know her before she was clerk of court? No, I did not. <clears throat> did you come to know her once she was elected clerk of court? Yes, I did. And uh, was it a pleasant relationship? It was. And how did you come to be, and uh, to cut to the chase, you ended up being in the courtroom during the Murdoch trial for part of those six weeks, is that correct? Yes, sir. <clears throat> how did you come to be there? Um, when Beck and I met each other at a conference, clerk of court's conference, where it was she was discussing that she had that trial coming up, and I knew that she was relatively new, and I said, I'll offer to come help you if you would like. And I think she ended up talking to Judge Newman about it, and they both said, yes, it would be good that I was there. Okay, because I, you, you tried a murder case or few uh, two in the past, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And <clears throat> um, did you go and help uh, Becky Hill try that murder case? I did. I couldn't go for the first three days because I had – court in Barnwell, and I told both of them, if I had court going on in Barnwell, I could not be in Colony County. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, had uh, Ms. Hill ever been the clerk of court that managed a murder trial prior to this? Not that I'm aware of, sir. So this were, was her first murder trial as far as you know? As far as I know of this magnitude, I don't know if they had one before then or not. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when, when did y'all, I mean, initially, what were you talking about in terms of logistics and how you did it and 
all those sorts of things? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> during that, the, the, before the trial, before you ever, we ever picked a jury, um, did, she, you, did she ever discuss with you that she was going to write a book? Yes, sir. And she wanted she to write a book. Yes, wanted sir. to write a book. Did she indicate what the book was going to be about? About the trial. About the Murdoch trial? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and did she discuss with you, what if anything did she discuss with you, about how <clears throat> she felt the verdict should turn out to be in the Murdoch trial? It, it re, uh, these are the, in reference to the book, how, what would help the book? Um, a guilty verdict. She, and tell us, tell the judge and, and me uh, what exactly she said to you that you remember. Um, this is prior to the trial. Okay. Well, first of all, she said we, we might want to write a book because she needed a lake house and I needed to retire. And um, <laughs> then further conversations, a guilty verdict would sell more books. And we left it at that. We, this was before even the, in December. And, and when, when did she ever say that again to you during this, the, the, the week she spent there? Several times. It could be said it was, you know, amongst friends in the, her office or we might be having dinner, that kind of stuff, but that's about it. That she needed a guilty verdict to sell more books? That would be the best way to sell books, yes, sir. The best way to sell books. Now, <coughs> during this, during this uh, process, uh, did she ever express to you an opinion on whether or not, in fact, was Mr. Murdoch guilty of the murders of his son and his, his uh, wife? Yes, sir. Tell me, tell me what she said and if you remember when. I don't exactly remember when. I know it's over half of the trial had already happened, but the evidence was coming forth that it looked like he might be guilty. And she made a comment that he, a guilty verdict would be better for the sale of books. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, as a result of a conversation you had sometime during the trial, I don't want you to, to relay to me the, 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 what was told you, did you have a discussion with the clerk, Becky Hill, uh, about her being with jurors on her own? Yes, sir, I did. One morning I showed up, up to Colony County and I was um, told that she had taken a juror home the night before. And I was in the courtroom and I saw her and it was between the pews and where the back row pews are. And I mentioned to Miss Becky, I said, please tell me you didn't take a juror home last night. And she told me, she says, I did, but I didn't talk about the case. I had a bailiff with me, Mr. Bill was with me. I said, Becky, you don't do things like that. I thought we had stopped everything. It was, wasn't far enough along to really um, cause a major problem or I would have told Judge Newman, but I thought we had an understanding that you did not spend time along <coughs> with, the, with the jurors. Okay. Now, <coughs> I'm going to <coughs> read you some statements. Um, well, first of all, did you ever hear, hear her say anything in front of you to a juror about whether or not uh, on the merits of the case, that is, whether or not he was guilty or innocent or what you should pay attention to, did you ever hear her what, if anything, did you ever hear, hear her say to a juror or in the presence of a juror? Anything? No, sir. Okay. But let me ask you if you've ever heard her say these statements, and if so, to who? Um, Don't be fooled by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys, which I understand. Uh, I mean, do not be fooled by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys. You ever hear her say that? Your Honor, this time I would object. Uh, this witness was specifically called as a Rule 16.3b um, extrinsic evidence. Uh, I think we've covered uh, the two grounds that uh, would be permissible for her to testify to, and I, I believe that that should be the, uh, the extent of her testimony, so we would object any further extrinsic evidence as uh, improper impeachment and uh, also irrelevant. I, I think that the, the issues that were raised with the prior witness have been covered, and that was the express reason that this witness was called, and Your Honor allowed the testimony. Overruled. You may continue. Thank you. Did you ever hear her say that? Can you repeat the, the verbiage? Don't be fooled by the evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys. Yes, I did. And was it, who was it said to? It was said to me. Okay. And sometimes it might be a staff member in the <coughs> her office or someone from the media there. But other than that, I didn't hear her say it out there in front of any jurors. Did she ever um, say to you or to 
other people around you, I'm not talking about jurors, watch him closely talking about Mr. Murdoch. Um, this is just before he testified. Look at his actions, look at his movements. Did you ever hear him say, her say that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you ever have any conversations with the, the uh, bailiff, Mr. Bill? Yes, sir. Did he ever discuss with you uh, the clerk's contact with jurors? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Did you ever hear her say um, that the defense is going to try to confuse the jurors? Did you ever hear, hear her say that? No, sir, I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me take deal with one last area. <clears throat> Let me see if I can simplify this. There were, <clears throat> there was a setup in the courtroom. <clears throat> pardon me, I, I've got a little frog in my throat. Um, and I, no, I'm fine, thank you. I think so. I'll share my bottle over here if he wants part of it. <laughs> Once a cork, always a cork, Your Honor. Um, so, and I was there, you were there, this judge was not there. And, um, Prosecution tables over here, defense tables over here, judges up here, and then there's a rail behind which the cork was, and because of all the massive electronic equipment we had there with big screens, there was an area over on my right facing the judge, um, and then I think you were located in that area right between the judge and that area, is that correct? Talking about in the well area? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, sir. Now, For the most part, now sometimes I was out there with the, um, the screen. Right. In the gallery. Right. Um, but there was a screen in, on which you could see not only what the gallery back there could see, but the, the, the images that only the jury was supposed to see that were under seal. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, um, there's a woman named Rhonda Ryder, correct? Um, Rich. Rich. And tell me who she is. At the time, we did not know who she was. The first time. The first time they were there, we didn't know. Then she came in Miss Becky's office the night before, and she asked if she could have another seat in the uh, courtroom for the next day. And Miss Becky said yes. And she says, and, "And what's your name again?" And the only reason why I remember Rhonda, because of course my name being Rhonda. And the next day, Miss Rich was sitting. I don't know how to tell you, but she was sitting. Do you know where Doug was sitting? Yes, ma'am. All right. I know, Judge, you don't know where Doug was sitting, but anyhow. <laughs> um, but, but Doug uh, was the audiovisual guy, and he had access to the unscreened, the unsealed images, correct? Yes, sir. And she was sitting right next to him, right? Yes, sir, okay. in that little part. And so she could see the, the, the body cam, she could see the unredacted uh, corpse pictures, the autopsy pictures, all it, the photos that the judge had, uh, had sealed, correct? Well, no, the only thing she could see was what was being put up at the time. Right, right, right. But, okay. but as they were put up, she could see them. Right, but they tried their best to seal it where you couldn't, but you could still see it there. I didn't see any of the photos, right. okay? But she could see them. Right, and Doug and, was really having a problem with that. And I can also tell you that our court reporters didn't know who she was either, okay? Okay, and who, she turns out to be a writer, correct? Yes, sir, after I found out, yes, sir. And she, her name is Rhonda Rich. Correct. She was given access to areas that only court personnel should have had access right. to. Right. But then we then we broke, and then she moved her in the well with me. She was about on my left, and either Elizabeth or Mike was on my right, and I noticed she was taking notes. And I asked her what was she doing taking notes. She says, I'm a Sunday school teacher. Well, I immediately <laughs> covered up everything I had. <laughs> and, you don't trust um, Sunday school teachers? <laughs> so. you know. You don't trust Sunday school teachers? Uh, let me just, look, there's too many preachers in my family on both sides, okay? <laughs> <coughs> so um, you determined she was not a Sunday school teacher and later learned, on, learned that she was a writer writing about the Murdoch case, correct? Now, I don't know if she's ever a Sunday school teacher or not. There's just, <laughs> I, I don't even know where she goes to church or anything, so I can't tell you that answer. But I did find out that she was a writer because after, shortly after she was put there, and I'm, evidently after I covered everything up, shortly after that, Judge Newman asked for a recess so we could find where people were going to be working. And that's when um, we put, she put Miss Rich out in the gallery 
in control of that screen. And and she ended up writing the forward to uh, Becky's book. Is that correct? That's yes, sir. Okay. And Becky gave her access to area only the only court personnel should have had. Is that correct? That is true. But now I'll be honest with you, sir. There's been a couple times when we had other people that were sitting on that side. Of the door. We weren't planning on seeing sealed documents that day. Right. But there were some other people that sat there, but nobody that actually sat in the well that wasn't court people. Okay. Thank you, Court Indulgence. Ms. Waters. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Waters, I'm Judge, do you have an extra bottle of water up there by any chance you're willing to share? Oh, Miss Elizabeth Scott, one. Thank you. Great. Miss <laughs> McQueen, how you doing today? I'm good, sir. Please call me Rhonda. I always called you Miss Rhonda. I've known you for a long time as well. In fact, yes, I, I tried one of those murder cases in front of you years ago. Right. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask a couple things. Uh, I won't be that long. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, you said earlier is you said when you initially were talking to Miss Hill, you said she said something like, we ought to write a book or something that like that. That is correct. Okay. And so did y'all have any further discussion about you writing the book or participating with the book? Oh, or no, like sir. That? I'm crazy enough not to write one. Okay. Uh, during the course of, though, after the trial, uh, she did send you, like, chapters and things like that to take did, a look at. I did get to see a couple of drafts uh -huh. of the of the of the manual. Okay, so she did send you those to, to take a look at and review and that sort of thing. Is correct. that correct? Okay. All right. Um, and you were asked a, and again, Your Honor, just uh, to be clear, I've made some objections. Uh, you, you, you do not waive any objections by cross-examination. They are all preserved. Thank you, Your may proceed. Thank you. You uh, mentioned, uh, you know, some statements that you attributed to uh, to Miss Hill, um, you know, during the course of conversations during the course of the trial. Is that correct? Just just things like watching closely, watches mirrors, correct, and correct. things like that. And where were those conversations? Were those conversations taking back taking place back in the clerk's offices with the clerk staff and people like that? Yes, sir. In the clerk's office, it might have been downstairs in the bathroom. Okay. Uh, some of us had privilege to go to. All right. So y'all, you and Miss Becky and, and other court staff, maybe just discussing the case and that sort of thing. Is that correct? That is correct. And people were expressing their opinions about what was going on and that sort of thing. Is that correct? No, when we were having those discussions, there weren't more than one or two, maybe three people there. Okay. But just a few people there just talking back behind the scenes. Is that, That's what I'm correct. driving at. Yes, sir. Behind it the scenes. It was behind the scenes. And it's not uncommon for, you know, clerk staff behind the scenes, not to the parties, not to the litigants, not to the jurors. But among themselves, back in you know, in the hallways back there, to talk about the day's activities and things like that. Is that is that fair? That's correct. Okay, and that's a big difference between the natural conversations that people that work together, court staff, and the like have with each other, and actually having those conversations in front of the jurors. Right? There's a big difference between those two. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and it's not uncommon for you. You're a clerk of court. You got people that work for you. Y'all are going to have private conversations about what's going on that are not to be shared, particularly with jurors, but, but with the public as well. Is that fair that to say? That is true. Okay. All right. And so they, there were conversations like that going on that, that you were privy to and part of. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. And you mentioned a little bit about, uh, well, let me ask you this. So there are all these conversations going on, and, and that's natural. That happens, private conversations with court staff uh, behind closed doors. But you never once saw or observed or had anyone tell you that any of those conversations were being shared by Miss Becky with any juror. Is that right? That is correct. All right. And if, if that had happened, if you had observed anything untoward or improper going on at this particular trial, you would have immediately gone to Judge Newman as part of your obligation. Is that correct? That is correct. And you never did that because you never observed anything like that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. Um, now, uh, you were asked a little bit about uh, Rhonda Rich, who was a member of the media, and, and how she was placed. Uh, kind of back, back where uh, the defense IT guy was. Is that no, correct? I didn't say she was part of the media, sir. Okay. Well, she was a writer. Yes, sir. Okay. 
All right, and then you said that uh, that eventually, though, Judge Newman stepped in, and then she was moved out into the into the gallery in charge of the screen out there. So, right, but I don't know. I thought Miss Becky moved. I'm not saying Judge Newman did. Okay. All right, and um, over there in that area of the, uh, if, if we look in the courtroom, there was sort of the grand jury box over here, and that was where. Uh, court TV was and media was stationed and that sort of thing. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, and, and inevitably there were media members that could view some of the images that were being shown. They were just not able to report those just because of the nature of the, where the courtroom uh, was. Is that is that accurate? Well, I was told they couldn't see it, so I don't know what they actually saw because I didn't discuss it with the media. All right, you never had a conversation with Court TV or anything like that? Other than the fact that be careful what they put on my front page of the New York Times on me. All right. All right, and you're not aware of any image or confidential information or sealed image or anything like that that was ever made privy to Miss Rich uh, that, that was in, put in any sort of publication or anything like that. Is that correct? Not I'm aware of, sir. Okay, because if you had found out about that too, you would have immediately gone and reported that to Judge Newman because you would have said that's improper. That I need to go report to, to the judge, correct. correct? Correct. And you never once saw anything during the entire course of this trial that caused you to say, you know what, I got to go talk to Judge Newman. Something ain't right about what's going on here. Is that correct? That is correct. And you would have done that without a doubt if you had seen that, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Now, <clears throat> um, in looking at, you know, back at this trial, uh, you, you mentioned that there was a few days at the beginning of trial. Um, that you weren't there because you had your own court to take care of back in Barnwell County, correct? Correct. All right. And then uh, pretty much after that, I guess you were pretty much present the majority of the remainder of the time. Is that fair to say? I was. Okay. I had one for medical procedure done. I missed two days. But basically other than that, I was there every day. All right. And there was a period of time, though, during the middle of the trial uh, where Miss um, Becky had, had a, a medical issue and, and had to be absent from the courtroom for about a week or something like that. That is, is that, correct. Okay, and during that period of time, you were present and, and functioning as the lead clerk of court during that period of time. That is correct. All right, so the, rea the reality is, is that you were present for a, you know, probably as much, if not more, than anyone in the clerk's function, function during the course of this trial. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and again, just to reiterate, there was not one time that you observed or came in possession of any information that you were like, I got to go talk to Judge Newman about this. No, sir. All right. Courts and government. Thank you. Very good, Mr. Parker. Man, half, yes, sir. A half a question. All right, um, Mr. Waters <coughs> indicated to you that you were not aware of whether or not, and you agreed that you never witnessed her talking to a juror about the evidence. Is that correct? We that agree is on correct. that. Um, <coughs> do you know? And but she did admit to you that she had she had been with a juror alone in a car for some period of time. Um, when you confronted her with that, is that correct? Yes, sir. And did she indicate to you what she talked to that juror about while they were alone in the car? No, sir. She told me, the only thing she told me was that she did not discuss the case, that she had Mr. Bill, the bailiff, with her, and he could tell her that. Tell, okay. tell that. And, and um, when she said she didn't discuss the case, um, did you bring that up or did she bring that up? She brought that up. You didn't say shouldn't be with him because it's frowned upon. Um, I did tell her that I would caution her on doing that because the perception of dealing with the jurors one-on-one -on -one is, is not tolerated. It's not tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McElveen. Uh, you may be excused. Thank you. All right, Mr. Harputin, call your next witness. Uh, your Honor, we would call juror 741. Uh, I know you're not going <laughs> Well, that's right. She's an alternate. That, that's, that's all right. I 
I got you. And Your Honor, while she's coming, my understanding is I'm limited to four questions. Yes, sir. I, I have a copy, and I, I have given uh, uh, the, the court reporter a copy of this affidavit with the name obscured and the number, I think, as well. So, but the affidavit that supports this testimony that you're about to offer is Courts Exhibit 5. Other than the fact the background about her getting picked for the jury and how long she was on the jury and that's her excuse, that's I, all we intend on asking these four questions. All right, sir. Unless Mr. Waters uh, asks. Sure. I mean, they'll have uh, right. cross-examination. I'll be crossing, so oh, he, definitely, he will definitely open the door. That, <laughs> so all right. He's, he's limited to the four questions. Is that, yes. No, sir. I, I, he's just telling me that's what he intends to do. Fine. Sometimes you can hold lawyers to that, and sometimes you can't, Mr. Miller. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I, I, I intend on only asking her those four questions. That's fine. It only doesn't have to be Yeah. The numbers? Yeah. testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, I Thank you. Please have a seat on the stand. Your Honor, I assume the same rules would apply to her that apply to the other jurors in terms of her image appearing. That's correct. All right. There'll be no photograph uh, made of this particular witness who was an alternate juror in the matter. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to refer to you as Juror 741, <laughs> it's what we got to do here so we don't use your name so people don't know who you are. Um, is that okay with you? That's fine. And um, you and I have uh, met before. Correct. I came to your home one Sunday afternoon. I believe you are cooking Sunday dinner, and we talked. Is that correct? Correct. And then um, you were interviewed by SWED. Correct. And you gave them a recorded statement. And then uh, this morning you came here and you gave me an affidavit that you signed, and you're here with your lawyer, is that correct? Correct. Now, <clears throat> um, just for purposes of the record, you were a juror, you were pit selected to be a juror on the state versus Alec Murdaugh uh, murder charge, correct? Correct. And you sat in the courtroom for six weeks and listened to all the testimony. Correct. And you were the uh, alternate. Correct. And so when the jury went out to deliberate, you were excused. Is that correct? correct? Now, um, I'm going to go through a series of questions based on your affidavit, okay? Okay. Which you signed this morning, which was based on our initial interview with you and your interview with SWED. This is basically the same thing you told SWED, is that correct? Correct. In your affidavit, you say, before the defense put up their case, I'm going to the lead. Sir, leave. Uh, overrule. Thank Go ahead. You. Thank you. In your affidavit, you said before the defense put up their case, Ms. Hill told the jurors, quote, the defense is about to do their side. They're going to say things that will try to confuse you. Don't let them confuse you or convince you or throw you off, unquote. Is this true? Did Ms. Hill say That's that? That's exactly what she told us. I'm sorry? That's exactly what she told us. Okay. Um, the next thing you say is Ms. Hill made the above statement warning the defense would try to confuse us in the presence of all the jurors as we assembled in the same jury room. Is that correct? Correct. Now, y'all were initially in two We were in two separate rooms, and when she came in, we all went in one room. Okay. Um, paragraph number five, Ms. Hill said, if you get emotional, we want to see your face because that is what they want to see. What, is, what does that said, mean? Don't she said, don't get nervous. Don't get, be afraid to show your emotions because that's what they want to see. Who wants to see? I, I don't know who she was speaking of. I'm, I'm assuming the court. Okay. And then number six, um, 
Ms. Hill also informed us Alex Murdoch was going to testify, but I don't recall exactly what she said. All the jurors were, jurors were assembled in one room when she made that comment. Is that she told you that Alex Murdoch was going to testify. Is that did, did you know before that he was going to testify? I think we knew that he was going to come up. I think he was supposed to do it the day before, but he didn't. And I knew he, he was going to be the last person that afternoon. Okay. During the visit to Moselle, juror number 826 and I walked to the scene together. Then juror 826 began walking with the clerk of court, Becky Hill. I could tell they were talking. I could not hear what was said between them. Is that correct? Correct. Is what you put in this affidavit truthful? Yes, sir. And this is what you told us back in I don't August, remember that August, I believe. Ago. I think I interrupted you cooking Sunday dinner. Right. Um, all right, thank you. Please answer any questions uh, defense may have for you. Mr. Waters. Or Mr. Maddox. Thank you, Thank you, please, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. 741. It's nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> When's the first time you talked to Mr. Harpootlian or Mr. Griffin or any other attorney? I can't tell you exactly. It's been months. It's probably been September, August. It's been months. Okay. And were they the first attorney to talk to you or did was there somebody else that talked to you? Prior to them, any other attorney? No, I think he was the first person I talked to. You, you sure? I think. It was so many people trying to call me, and I was trying not to be involved, so I can't, I can't quite remember. I but he was the first person I'd seen. First person in person? Yes. Okay. So when he came to your house? Yes. Mr. Harpootlin came to your house? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and at that point, was Miss Holly with him? Holly, do you mind raising your hand? You see Miss Holly? Yes. Okay. And was anybody else with him? Yes. He was. Mr. Griffin. Thank Mr. You. Griffin. Thank you. <laughs> and you gave them, them a statement then, right? Right. Okay. And um, did, did they record you? I mean, were they um, audio or video recording you? Did they say we'd like to record this? No. They didn't? But neither did the people that came out. They didn't, I didn't know I was being recorded by them neither. I'm, I'm not trying to fuss. Oh, okay. But is there an audio recording of, of your conversation with them that you know of? No. Did they say? Not that I know of. No. Okay. So you don't remember saying? No audio recording. We're required to tell her for recording her under rules. We did he's record on, her. He's on cross examination. Thank you, Um And at that point, uh, and that was again, do you remember? You said you think, would you? Was that around the end of August, 1st of September, when they first came and talked to you? Roughly. Out, roughly. Okay. I don't want to. And you told them basically everything that you've told us now, right? Yes. Exact same thing. Exact same thing that I told them. Nothing less, nothing more. Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Harpootley, and just and, and and you didn't you didn't sign an affidavit back in September, or when you talked to him the first time? No. Or, and why not? Because he was just coming out to talk to me. He just was asking questions. It wasn't nothing officially. He had, you know, so. What, 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 when you say nothing officially, I don't know what you mean. He didn't, he was just coming out to ask, he was just asking questions about what, what went on during the trial. It wasn't. Well, did they ask you to sign an affidavit that no. day? No. Okay. Did they ask you to sign an affidavit any time right after that? No. They never asked you to sign an affidavit until this week? No, I was supposed to meet with them um, a couple of occasions, but I, have, I was having my own personal issues and I couldn't come. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that. No problem. Um, so you told them at this first meeting back the end of August, 1st of September, that y'all were going to hear some things that will throw you off. Don't let it distract you or mis mislead you. Is that what you said? That's it. I didn't say that. That's what the clerk of court said. Yeah, I'm saying that's what oh, you yeah. said to them. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Okay, and where where did that take place? Um, she would always stay like on the outside of the jury though. I mean, room like in between, like on the outside. She would never really come inside the jury room. So you were in. There were two rooms, right? Yeah. Okay. One room. 
and then the other room separated it, correct? Right. And you couldn't hear people talk in the other room, could you? No, that's why when she came, everybody came in one room. Okay, so in this comment you said she made, did she bring everybody out in the hallway? Some people was in the hall. That's why I said she was standing, she was standing right at the head of the door. Standing at the head of the door. Right. Was Mr. Bill there? Your, your bailiff? Yeah, he, he would be standing in the hallway. He's all out there, right? Right. And then she said in front of everybody, the defense is about to do their side. They're going to say things that will confuse you. Don't let them confuse you or convince you or throw you off. She said Ex that to everybody. She said that to everybody. So everybody could have heard. Everybody could hear it. And you said you were all in the same jury room. Yeah, we would all be in the same jury. When she came, she was standing in front of the door with the jury room that I was in, right. and everybody would come over. They would let us know before she came. Like a, she, they would let us know, like, after lunch, she's going to come talk to y'all. And we all would gather together. So would you go from the two rooms into one room? Some would be standing out. She would stand in front of the door. Some would be standing around her outside the door, and some would be in the room. But it was clear enough for us to hear, us, hear and see her. See her. And I'm just, Mr. Arputlian led you, and Ms. Hill made the above statement warning that the defense would try to confuse us in the presence of all of the jurors as we had assembled in the same jury room. We was all in the same jury room. We, you, you, she would be on outside the door, and we would be in the room, and someone would be standing beside her. We was all, always all together when she came. And uh, do you think that was unusual? No, because I mean, she, I guess she didn't want to walk back and forth the room to room. No, a fact of what she said. Do you think that was unusual? Yeah, I did. And uh, if you get emotional and see his face, uh, they want people to see your face? Because, you know, some of, the, some of the jurors was getting emotional, and I guess she noticed it, so she, she commented on it. And you said you didn't, the statement he read, she informed you that uh, the defendant was going to testify, but don't recall exactly what was said. At the, yeah, I can't. When, when was that? That, that was, uh, I think he came in the afternoon, like at 2.33, so that was before he testified, I think. And where was it? Oh, in the jury room. Where we, we were all, like I said, we were all meet. And, and I guess what I'm saying is you're in two different rooms for a while, right? When y'all get up there, you split, don't you? Kind of yeah. Like the people that talk loud in one room and the others in the other one? <laughs> Pretty much. No, it's not like that. It was just they just split it off. They just asked us what room we wanted to go to. So when you were fixing to come back to the jury room, <coughs> to, the, to the box, mm -hmm. you tell us you'd all go into one jury room together? Only when she came to speak to us. And Mr. Harpootlin asked you about, um, I believe, number seven on the affidavit. And when did you sign this affidavit? This morning. Okay. And when's the last time you had talked to Mr. Harpootlin? No, or I haven't here? talked to him since he came to my house. That's, or any of them before today? No, I haven't talked to him since he came to my house. Talked to anybody else involved in this case before today since then? No, he was talking to my lawyer. Okay, and who was that? Sean Wilson. Okay. And when had Sean Wilson talked to you? He's been my lawyer. Since when? Since 2021. Okay. When Mr. Wilson talked to you about this case and what you told Mr. Harpootley and Pyrica. To... All right. They apparently don't object to this, but I am very uncomfortable with your asking what her lawyer told her. And I wasn't going to contest. I was just looking for timing. Well, she's told you a couple of times that he was her lawyer since okay. 2021. Well, see your lawyer for this. For what you mean for this? Well, we're like being a juror. For being a juror? Yes, ma'am. I didn't have a, he was always my lawyer. Okay. You didn't hire him for this? No, I didn't hire him for this. Okay. But he had talked to Mr. Harpootlin about your affidavit and your testimony today, hadn't he? Was that a yes? Yes, he was looking over the paperwork. He's look, he was looking out for me because he's my attorney. And when was he looking over the paperwork? Oh, I don't. I could, I guess ever since September, October, I don't, I don't, I wasn't really keeping up with it, with it, to be honest, because I'm. So do you know if he's talked to Mr. Arpugner this week? Yeah, he talked to him today. Talked to him today? We was together. Who was together? Me and my lawyer. 
In Mr. Arpigan? I, yes, when I went to go sign the affidavit. Okay. Where did you sign it? At his office. At whose office? Mr. Hopcooper's office. Your Honor. I was I, supposed I, to. I would object, Mr. Okay. This meandering, uh, I mean, there's no jury here. It's you. <laughs> and I don't know what this is. I think we got all the information. To... Yeah. All right. I think he's going to move on. I, I hope so. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that's the last question Mr. Harpoon didn't ask you about this affidavit, did it? What was the last question? Um, During the visit to Bose or Jury, say the number, whatever the letter is, it doesn't matter. You saw uh, a juror, and I walked the scene together, then the juror began talking with the clerk of court. I could tell you, could tell they were talking, but I couldn't hear what they were said between them. That's Correct. the last question he asked, right? Correct. So, and you have no idea what that conversation was about, do you? No, I don't. Now the next, number eight, he didn't ask you about, was I also overheard discussions in the jury room that Mr. Hill drove a juror home. I believe it was a juror whose nickname was Boston. Now he didn't ask you that a minute ago, did he? No, but, Just okay, yesterday. no. And you didn't include that in the first conversation you had with him back in August and September in this affidavit. Miss Holly did, did you? You didn't tell him about that? I don't know. I don't, I can't remember. Uh, have you seen the affidavit Ms. Holly did for you back in September 1st, 2022? Ms. Holly did not do an affidavit. Ms. Holly she did, an did aff her know. affidavit, her notes of what uh, this young lady said to her. And what she included and didn't include was based on what Ms. Holly thought was relevant at the time. But right, she yeah, can't that, be cross-examined. That, that is not in evidence, Mr. Meadows. So I think we don't need to offer it, John. Sir? I'd offer it. Just to well, how is this thing going to be authenticated? You know, even more importantly, he can't, he, he can't question her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. can't talk at one time. I don't even have the affidavit. Let me see what you're talking about. You're talking about the one that was just offered today? This is one uh, uh, Holly did when he first talked to her back in August, and she's referring to Miss Miller. Okay. Miss Miller. This is... Miller, <coughs> Miller's affidavit about what uh, she thinks uh, Ms. Uh, the, this juror said. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to allow this, Mr. Meta. I don't see a whole lot of difference between this and what's been said in the affidavit that uh, has been offered by Mr. Waters, but uh, uh, I'm not going to allow that. Okay. Thank you. You did not tell them about hearing that Miss Hill had driven a juror home back when you met with them in September, did you? I can't remember. Boston. She was a juror on the on the trial. I don't know her, but that was the nickname they gave her. I don't know her first name. And what, if anything, did, did you know or convey about Boston? She was a juror on the case, just like everybody else. Okay. Anything else? No. Nothing. Ma'am? No. <laughs> okay. So again, Mr. Harpootley didn't ask you, but when you, in your Set in the affidavit of today, mm -hmm. I also overheard discussions in the jury room that Miss Hill drove a juror home. I believe it was a juror whose nickname was Boston. Is that something was added after your lawyer was Mr. with Mr. Hartley today? I don't know if I added it. I, I, we talked about it today, but I don't know if I mentioned it in September or not. That's but I know it. You've ever talked about it, wasn't it? Your Honor. No, it's not. No reason to raise objection. The first thing is, Mr. Meadows, 
I'm going to caution you one more time about this. You cannot talk over a witness. The second thing is you don't need to be marching all back around here. You're talking only to me, not the jury or anything else. So let's slow down and, you know, this is repetitive of questions that have been asked before. If you want to take this tone with her, I don't know exactly what you're trying to accomplish. I'm not but, trying to take the tone with you. I apologize. She knows that, and I'm sorry. Well, you're just talking to me. I'm sorry. This is not some drama thing for the jury. I know. I'm sorry. All right. Well, sorry. let's, let's, let's it, finish it just, this thing up. The only reason I did it, what he hadn't asked about it, and it to me is the key issue here they're trying to, to well, say was different. Mr. Meadows, I mean, you lecturing to the witness or to me or what? Please don't do that. Strike that from the record, please. Don't All strike. Right. Don't strike. Let, let's I'm line so sorry. Let's I'm sorry. line this up. I am. All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it, in number nine in the affidavit that before the jury began deliberating, I heard a member of the court staff say the deliberation shouldn't take long. I don't remember specifically who made it, but it was made in the presence of the entire jury right after closing arguments in the jury room. Correct. Then I think you said something. Uh, Judge Newman came to see you afterwards, but after the jury went to their room, you were in a separate. No. When we first room. left out of the courtroom, we all went in the same um, jury room. And then they separated me. And Ms. Simpson, what I didn't mean to raise my voice. Oh, that's, that's okay. okay. I apologize. That's fine. But when, when they started deliberating, were you in a separate room? Yeah, when they started deliberating. So you had no involvement in the deliberations or verdict of Richard Alexander Murdoch at no, all, sir. did you? No, sir. You didn't get to come back to the verdict, did you? No, sir. Have you read Miss Hill's book? No. Okay. And I noticed your interview. I did watch it. And <laughs> I think uh, Mr. Radford back there, you can raise your hand, kind of, Radford. Mm -hmm. I think came to your place and interviewed you. Right. Uh, at some point during the trial, I think there was some discussion that somebody might have wanted to do an interview with you. Yeah, that's what she said. Okay, and then after the trial, I think there was some discussion. Somebody, since you weren't on the jury, they may not have wanted to interview you. You remember that? Roughly telling the officer that? Yeah, that's not what she said. She came to me uh, roughly in the middle of the trial, and she said, I have a few people who would like to interview. She said I had, no, she didn't say a few. She said I have a lot of people that's inquiring interview with you. She said, but I'll have to get with you after the trial. But after the trial, she came back in the jury room and she hand, started handing out um, cards. And she handed everybody cards but me. And she was like, I don't have any cards for you, for you for an interview because no one wants to speak with you. That's what was said. And did, uh, I mean, you weren't happy with that, were you? Yes, I was. You were happy with I'm, that? I'm, I'm, I don't need to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, court adult. Briefly, briefly, Your Honor. Just ask you a series of questions that I'm not sure I've heard before. Who approached you during the trial and indicated the media would want to interview you? Miss Hill. Miss Hill. Miss Hill herself. Just you or all the jurors? She, I, she, I was. We was. Um, they had. I think it's the day they had the bomb threat, and we. I think that was the day, and she approached me. You. Me by myself. Oh, by yourself. And where were you? It. Oh, that's the day in the lunchroom when they had the bomb threat. We went to the middle school. I believe that was today. The middle school, and she came over to you and said what? That uh, she had um, some reporters that was reaching out to her that wanted to speak with me. To you? Yeah. Not the whole jury, to you. Was there anybody with you at that time? No. It was Did just she me. indicate why they wanted to speak with you? Just you? No. Did she indicate what reporters? No. Um, and uh, did she ever talk to you about doing interviews with the media after that? No. But you indicated she brought some cards at some point? She brought cards in the hand to the jurors. Before? After. After? The um, verdict was read. Cards of media people? Yes, sir. 
Did she tell you she was writing a book? No. Did she indicate to you why it might be good for her if you did media interviews? No. But she had a conversation with you in the lunchroom of the I middle school. I believe it was the lunchroom. I think the day of the, the bomb threat. The day but of the I'm, bomb threat. But I'm 100% sure she came to me and she told me that in the middle of the trial. Was there a bailiff with her or just no, her? No, it was just her. Pulled you over and said, hey, I can, I can make you famous. I can put you on TV. <laughs> She said she had media that wanted to talk to me. That's what she said. Okay. <laughs> I hyperbolize. I apologize, Your Honor. Yes, sir. That's all I have. <laughs> all right. No further questions, Mr. Harpoon? No, Your Honor. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. You, uh, you are excused. All right, Mr. Harpootlin. That it? I need to put one matter on the record, Your Honor, and then it, and that is it. All right. All right. Um, Your Honor, um, earlier today you received a very short um, affidavit from Juror Z. We'd like to proffer that and make it part of the record. Right. I did not admit it, but I'll uh, uh, accept a written proffer, and if you would give the thing to me. I, I saw it on the screen on my law clerk's uh, uh, computer, but I don't have a printed out copy. We don't, we don't either, but um, would you allow us to do that? Well, I will allow before I close the record with Ms. Harris, if you can get it to us. When can you get it to us? We could email it this afternoon. Very well. How about do this? How about email it to uh, Mr. Waters, to me, to Ms. Diaz, and to Ms. Harris, the court reporter? And I will say now that it's offered as a proffer, and I will receive it as a proffer. I have not admitted it into evidence. Yes, ma'am. All right. to uh, earlier on a uh, email uh, to the Japanese uh, television folks. Um, I do have copies of that. I'd like to make that part of the record. All right, but hand it up to me and let me see it. And also, of course, to Ms. Waters. The hearing um, before Judge Newman to seal the body cam videos was on May 26, 2023. This email is in July, just to give you the context. Of All right, going and on. This, th this is being offered as a after the fact uh, email to um, Rebecca Hill and her replies garnered from the emails that uh, were released by uh, Cotton County at a certain point. And it addresses the uh, issue I raised with Ms. Hill relative to the security of sealed uh, records. Exactly, Your Honor. All right, I'll exactly. admit it. Mr. Waters? As to this specific exhibit, Your Honor? Yes. Um, um, Your Honor, I mean, we don't have any objection other than the ones we've raised just generally yeah, to, the, to the testimony. But I have no further objection to Very Your good. Honor. Very good. All right. And Your Honor, that's all we would have. All right, hang on. All right, have you got a copy of it there? I got it. This is his next exhibit in Parkwood. Proper is 
Brooks is one. So this is two. All right. Your it's proper two. is your exhibit one, Mr. Harper's name, and this spot, uh, which I have admitted, is your exhibit two. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. All right. Now we proceed to closing. Uh, you prepared? Yes, ma'am. Very good. Mr. Waters. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Just to uh, go back and reiterate um, as to the standard, and, and ultimately, uh, we've, of course, argued that the defendant uh, has the burden. Um, we've also uh, discussed that the standard for Your Honor, of course, is first of all, was there any misconduct that occurred? And then, regardless of that, uh, whether or not there was any uh, effect on the verdict. And the standard has been expressed in multiple cases is whether the verdict is solely the product of honest deliberation or the product of outside influence. And that inquiry fundamentally, as the court recognized from uh, the very beginning, focuses on the jurors themselves because it doesn't necessarily matter what was said as much or what was intended or what was inadvertent, even assuming that those existed, what matters is, is what the jurors heard, what they perceived, and whether or not it had any sort of effect on the verdict. And Your Honor went through that inquiry with these jurors. Eleven of those jurors were clear and unequivocal that there was no effect on their verdict, and also clear and unequivocal that nothing was said that could in any way be in, uh, inferred as any sort of attempt to influence them. Um, and I think that's very important, Your Honor, because uh, you know there can be sometimes behind the doors, as we've talked about, I think some of the cases recognize this, that some conversations can go on and things like that can happen. Um, but ultimately, and while I think it, uh, there were some cases cited in some of the, uh, the various uh, South Carolina decisions, you know, that it's, not, that it's unrealistic and not surprising to think that sometimes things like that that can happen, an untoward comment or something uh, was said. Uh, but that, uh, you know, that was in Aldrich, Your Honor, in uh, the 1999 Supreme Court case. But the mere fact that something like that may be stated uh, that could be stated in a neutral reason is not enough to undermine the verdict because the inquiry ultimately boils down to what was it that those jurors heard and in the end though did they listen to the instructions from the trial judge did they come to a fair and honest verdict and your honor the evidence here is uh, overwhelming I would say from the people that matter and that's those jurors and that is there was no effect on the jurors and you saw every single one of them every single one of them very clearly and strongly looked you in the eye all 11 at least and I'll get to the 12th uh, one in a second but looked you in the eye and said no that didn't happen no I didn't hear anything like that no there was no effect on our verdict no this was our verdict and it was based solely which was your honor's question solely on the evidence and the law and the testimony at trial <laughs> and I think that that carries the day we have the one juror and I want to make sure because I'm about to say the number and I don't want to do that um, let me go back to Jersey. And let's look at Jersey and what she said, because Jersey also said that, yes, I said this was my verdict. I was polled and said this was my verdict. Jersey also said that my verdict was solely based on the evidence in the law of the testimony trial. Answer question number two, yes. Absolutely yes, but then goes on after that to say she heard some communications from the clerk and then says, well, it had an effect on my verdict. Even after she had already answered question number two when she said her verdict was based solely on the evidence and the law and the testimony at trial. And beyond that then, uh, Your Honor, I think that it's very telling that the affidavit that was submitted from this particular juror and it's it's we've been pointing this out from the beginning because it's very crucial and very telling because despite the things that she alleges that ha that happened even though the other jurors say it didn't despite the things that she alleges that happened she says that she voted guilty because she felt pressure from other jurors not that her verdict was in any way affected from some supposed external influence in that affidavit that was filed with the defense motion from day one that is what 
she says, that she felt pressure from other jurors. And, Your Honor, we've cited the cases over and over again that the internal mechanics of the jury room, the fact that one juror feels pressured by others, as long as there's not violence or things that, that go beyond the pale, that is not a basis for undermining a verdict. That is part of the deliberative process, and it's expected, and it occurs. But I think it's very telling that we have those conflicting answers. And, Your Honor, without waiving uh, any objection to the, the latest affidavit that we were just discussing from this juror, I think that's very telling. Because now we have answer number three as it relates to this particular juror. And, and of course, it is clearly manufactured and, and rehabilitated, uh, recognized by, after the fact. Um, she, of course, is, uh, this juror is represented by uh, uh, Joe McCullough. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, we've got now a third version of events from this very juror. So we have this juror who's given answers all over the place that are inconsistent with uh, 11 other jurors who were very strong and unequivocal that, yes, this was our verdict. It was based solely on the evidence, the law, and the testimony, uh, that there were no communications from Becky Hill that influenced that verdict. And I think ultimately when you look at uh, the case law, in the end, it's up to your honor to make that uh, ultimate determination and looking at all that uh, law together. Uh, we cited another, a number of decisions, including, as we discussed, uh, the questions to be had. I sent an email where we set out some, some questions that it's not uncommon, perhaps, for, juror, for a juror to have a second thought. But the law is very clear that it does not recognize that because what that would do would, would be to consistently and constantly put every verdict that occurs in any courtroom in this state or in the nation at risk. Jurors don't have to vote in perpetuity. They vote on one day and one day only. And here, Your Honor, the evidence is overwhelming that those jurors verdict was the product of honest deliberation and the only bit of contrary evidence to that effect is from a juror who frankly not only said that it was purely the, the result of honest deliberation, but then has answers all over the place. And, Your Honor, I, I would say that the other 11 jurors are credible, they were strong, uh, they were clear with Your Honor, and I think that ultimately that carries the day. Now, we've had testimony from other people uh, since the jurors were here. We've had testimony, obviously, from Ms. Hill. We've had testimony from Ms. Rhonda. And we've had testimony from this uh, alternate juror. Um, but again, none of that testimony at all goes to what is the ultimate test for your honor. And that is whether or not this verdict was the product of honest deliberation. And on that, again, the evidence is overwhelming and strong and clear that it was the product of honest deliberation. It's very interesting, as we look at some of the testimony from the other witnesses, and obviously we have Miss Becky, and as Your Honor has pointed out, we're not here to go through some of the issues that have been alleged or are percolating out there. That's not the point of this proceeding here today, but Miss Becky is a court reporter and then became a clerk and was clear to you that she never made any comment in an attempt to sway the jury one way or the other. We have Miss Rhonda. And Miss Rhonda came in and testified, but I would submit to your, your honor that this is kind of a red herring. Because what Ms. Rana described were conversations that she herself admitted are just the kind of conversations that go on. And that's the reality of it. The conversations that go on among a trial team when we're not in open court, where we're discussing things, the kind of conversations that go on among court staff behind the doors, those types of conversations go on. But that does not mean, nor does that necessarily indicate, that somebody's not going to come out here and do their job fairly and understand the distinction between influencing a jury and not doing that. And one thing that I think is very important is Miss Rhonda was at that trial more than Miss Becky was. And she was very clear. 
and I probably was as repetitive as anyone here today in asking that question over and over again because I didn't want that point to be lost, that Ms. Rhonda said I was there more than anyone else and I never saw anything or observed anything or had anything happen that would cause me independently to go to Judge Newman because that's what I would have done, to go to Judge Newman and say something's not right about this, this needs to be fixed, something's going on that's improper. And I think that that is an extremely crucial fact because Ms. Rhonda admitted and said, of course, as she would, that if something had happened that the judge needed to know about, she would have been the first one to do it. And it never happened. And she was here more than Miss Becky was. It never happened. When we look at the balance of those facts, when we have the clerk of court come in and testify that you know, maybe I did this or maybe I did that, maybe I plagiarized the book, a portion of it, maybe I did this, maybe I wrote in things in there that are based on community knowledge or newspapers or poetic license or whatever you want to call it, I, I don't care about the book. And I would submit that Your Honor doesn't need to care about the book either because the book and what happened with the book afterwards is not what is relevant to the inquiry. But she was clear that she did not have any attempt to influence that jury. She was clear about that. And Ms. Rhonda was clear that she was not aware of anything like that either. And what does that do but, but corroborate the most important witnesses here? The defense, I think in one of their letters, tried to say that Miss Becky was the state's star witness, and that's not what this inquiry is about. It's not what this inquiry is about at all, because as I've said from day one, if there were not facts to be litigated, if we had not done an investigation and had those 11 jurors say, that didn't happen, there was no effect on our verdict. We, this was the product of honest deliberation, we would be the first ones here standing here to say that. But what we do know, Your Honor, is that what Miss Becky said and ultimately what Miss Rhonda said corroborates who are the true, if you want to say it, and I'm, not, and I'm only using this term because the defense accused us of Miss Becky being our star witness, there are no star witnesses here. This isn't about stars. But what Ms. Becky and Ms. Rhonda do is corroborate who are the most important witnesses, and that are those jurors. And you have 11 of them strong as a rock saying this verdict was not influenced, nobody tried to influence, and regardless, it was the product of our honest deliberation. And you have one juror who said that too, but then has answers that are all over the place. And if you go back to her original statement, what she says is not external influence anyway. It's not sufficient under the law. So I think that the proof here is overwhelming. I think the proof here corroborates what those jurors say. I think the only juror that we have to contend with, her testimony is compromised. And I'm not saying that that person is in here maliciously lying. I just think that this process is a lot. But it's clear that if there was any attempt to influence this jury, those jurors who sat in that box, every single one of them, you saw them, and we saw them for six weeks. They are conscientious. They take their obligations seriously. They were not here to reward friends or punish enemies. They were here to do their job appropriately and fairly. You saw that in their eyes. You saw that in their mannerisms. You saw that in their demeanor. And they were strong and clear that this verdict was fair. Your Honor, we would submit that the motion for new trial be denied. Mr. Harputlin. Mr. Griffin will be arguing. All right. If I stand here, Your Honor. That way I won't be interrupted by Mr. Harputlian as I'm trying to make my points. Your Honor, 
I want to first start with State v. Green because I understand that that's the guidance, that's what we're following here, and and reading, you know, excerpts from State v. Green. Um, first, it is <clears throat> absolutely clear in State v. Green <clears throat> that we find ourselves, and the issue is whether there's a defendant's right to a fair and impartial jury under the Sixth Amendment has been violated. Reading from the opinion, it says, in the Sixth Amendment's context, the Supreme Court of the United States has held that, quote, any private communication, contact, or tampering with a jury during a trial about the matter pending before the jury is deemed presumptively prejudicial. Now, Green goes on to say <clears throat> that we are not going to categorically apply the presumption whenever there is a co contact with the jury. But the question is, is it prejudicial? Not whether the verdict would have been different. It is, is it prejudicial? And, and I will, I'll keep reading. Um, the court says, we're not persuaded that the Remmer presumption of prejudice, we're talking about prejudice, not is the verdict different. It was their prejudice, was this tainted process. Was it prejudice to the defendant? Was the process prejudicial to the defendant because of extraneous communications? Not whether the verdict would have been different, but whether there's prejudice involved in the process of the trial. Um, the court goes on to say, our unwillingness to categorically apply the Remmer presumption of prejudice stems from our view that not every inappropriate comment by bailiff to a juror rises to the level of constitutional error. Goes on to say the attempted bribery of the jury in Remmer, Remmer conduct, which goes to the heart of the merits of the case, is a far cry from the circumstances presented in this case. The bailiff's actions here, though improper, did not touch the merits, but only dealt with the procedural question of how the judge might handle a jury impasse that apparently never materialized. Um, <clears throat> the court says while we decline to adopt the Remmer presumption of prejudice in every instance of inappropriate bailiff communication to a juror, the occasion of this case presents an opportunity for our clerks of court and circuit judges to ensure that all bailiffs are properly trained. Now, the only thing the Green did was reject the presumption of prejudice in every case. And, and Your Honor, I'm, I'm not going to, I just want to preserve for the record that our position is that the comments that you heard in this case go to the merits, go to the heart of the defense. And if you find that those comments were made, and, I, and I'm going to establish for the record, we clearly made, we clearly have proven that, that then we do get the Remmer presumption, that we do get the Remmer presumption if we have proven these comments were made, but, but I'm going to argue that we proved prejudice also in this case. So to start with, let's go um, to the evidence that was presented uh, since Friday, and, and Your Honor, we have, we have 12 deliberating jurors. In this case, what you've heard, three of the 12 have testified under oath that they heard Ms. Hill make comments about the case, whether it's you know how they categorize it as merits or not. But Juror X on Friday, Juror X on Friday, acknowledged that Ms. Hill made a comment about Alex was going to testify, that it was going to be epic or some words like that, and that defendants don't normally testify. That, that's what Juror X said on Friday. Today, so that's one who says Miss Hill made a comment about uh, Alex's testimony, how it's going to be a big deal, and, and defendants don't normally testify. Um, uh, Juror Z today says uh, that first she says uh, Miss Hill said to watch his actions, to watch him closely, and then she said there are other things that he said, I, I don't remember. And then we were allowed to, to show her, and with well, your honor, I asked her questions about her affidavit. And she says, confirm what was in her affidavit, that Rebecca Hill told the jury not to be fooled by evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys, which I understood to mean that Mr. Murdoch would, be, would lie when he testified. She also acknowledged, a tr this is a truthful statement, that she instructed the jury to, quote, watch him closely, close quote, immediately before he testified including look at his actions and look at his movements, which I understand to mean he was guilty. And she also said and confirmed that, that Ms. Hill 
said when they began deliberations that this, quote, this shouldn't take us long, close quote, and that if we deliberated past 11 p.m., that we'd be taken to a hotel. Um, those statements go to the merits. Those statements go to the heart of the defense. Those statements go to what Mr. Murdoch, his credibility. So that's two deliberating jurors down. The third deliberating juror who testified today is Juror P. And, and he says, you were asked, Juror P, did Ms. Hill make any comments about the case? And he says, yes. She said, the day that Alex was taking the stand, excuse me, Juror P is a he, but he is saying that she, Ms. Hill, said the day that Alex was taking the stand, that she, Ms. Hill, made the comment about Watch's body language. That's all I recall. So three of the 12 deliberating jurors heard Ms. Hill speak about Alec Murdoch's testimony. Three of the 12. And, and, then, and then we get the alternate juror came in and, and basically corroborated what those three of the 12 heard. And she had additional things that she had heard, but she corroborated what those three of the 12 heard. And then you've got Ms. Hill who gets on the stand and denies it all. And, and Your Honor, I, I couldn't agree with you more that you're able to judge the credibility of witnesses. And, and on this record, there's no way to find Ms. Hill credible. There's no way to credit her statements that she did not make these statements about his testimony. Um, I mean, she crossed herself up as Your Honor is questioning her about the transcript involving the egg lady and how the egg lady learned that, um, that there was some Facebook post that was allegedly attributed to her husband. There's no way the egg lady would have known that unless Ms. Hill told her, and, and that pretty much came out there. I mean, so, you know, and I know this is not a jury argument, but if someone misrepresents a fact to you once, I mean, I don't think you should go back and credit anything beyond that. What what we hear from Ms. McElveen is that she heard these almost identical statements from Ms. Hill that Ms. Hill told that three of the 12 deliberating jurors heard and, and the fourth alternate heard. That Ms. McElveen heard her make very similar statements about the defense's case, about Mr. Murdoch's testimony. So you got to put Ms. McElveen's testimony in, in our category. And, and Ms. Hill gets up there and says, never drove a juror home. Ms. McElveen's got no dog in this fight. And she says, she goes to court one day, she hears that Ms. Hill took a juror home the night before and went and talked to her and said, you, you can't do that. And Ms. Hill says, I, I, I didn't talk to her about the case. Well, she gets on the stand under oath here and tells you, I never took a juror home. I mean, it's totally inconsistent. And, and, and for her to say, I, I, I never made these statements, you know, she tried, I mean, she kind of gave herself a little wiggle room at the end. Well, when they were lining up, I may have said he's going to testify today or something. But these jurors heard this information. And the question under Green and Rimmer, it, was it prejudicial? Now, what we got from Juror Z today, the question was, did these comments influence your verdict? And Juror Z says, yes. Then you ask, how? And Juror Z says, to me, it felt like she made it seem like he was already guilty. Then you said, did it affect your finding of guilt in this case? And, and the answer was yes. And, and so that's prejudice, Your Honor. That is prejudice from one of the 12 deliberating jurors. Was your verdict influenced by what Ms. Hill said? And, and good grief, how could it not be? How could it not be? And, and, and to ask all these other jurors who heard the same thing, was it influenced, it, it, it's really an impossible task. Because you don't know what's influencing a jury, and frankly, that's why the Rimmer presumption is there, but, but, let's, but, but let's try to sort this out. And, and Your Honor, um, I think it was it was a State v. Kelly case where the um, where the 
deputies went out and they were investigating uh, the jurors' beliefs on the death penalty. And, and there was really no testimony about did that affect your verdict, but it was so, it, it was just so wrong. The conduct was so wrongful that the Supreme Court says that's prejudicial and we're granting a new trial. I mean, this is prejudice and this has been proven. I mean, Ms. Hill is not credible. Ms. Hill is not credible. And she's talking about her book, talking about taking literary license to lie. Literary, literary license to lie is what she, that's what she thinks a literary license is. Um, so her, her testimony should not be credited. We have proven, we, we have met our burden of proving that there was extraneous contact with these jurors. Three of the 12 deliberating jurors have testified to that. One of the 12 says, it influenced my verdict. How is that not prejudice? And that's all we have to prove. We believe, for the record, there is a presumption of prejudice that they have to overcome, but we have proven prejudice. And Your Honor, we respectfully request a, that a new trial should be granted based on the record developed today. Thank you. All right, uh, the arguments are closed. Um, I will take uh, until five of uh, uh, the hour uh, to examine my notes and then I will come and make a ruling from the bench on this matter. Court will be at ease.
Come to order, all rise. Please be seated. In the matter of the state of South Carolina against Richard Alexander Murdoch. 2022 GS 15005925935954 The following constitutes my ruling on this matter from the bench. Uh, this order will be supplemented as I will explain uh, after uh, proposed formal orders are received from each side in this matter. This case is unique in my 20 years of experience as a lawyer and my 35 years of experience as an active justice of the Supreme Court and a senior active trial and appellate judge. Usually matters involving possible improper contact with or conduct of a juror arise during or shortly after the trial. The judge then puts the affected juror or jurors under oath, conducts an examination, and rules on the request for a new trial or a mistrial. In this case, I was appointed almost nine months after the trial to replace the trial judge who was recused. It is now almost 10 months after the verdict was rendered and sentence imposed in this matter. It is now on appeal to the Court of Appeals. Several months after the appeal was filed, the defendant moved that his appeal be suspended and this matter be remanded to the trial court to consider his motion for a new trial on a charge that the clerk of court for Colleton County tampered with the jury by expressing her opinion to the jurors about what their verdict should be and about the credibility of the defendant who had elected to take the stand and testify on his own behalf. Since this matter has been remanded to me, I have set the matter, matter for a pretrial and a final hearing, conducted a telephonic status conference with the attorneys for the parties on December the 21st, 2023, I have received briefs from the parties. I conducted a pretrial proceeding on January the 16th, 2024, in which I invited briefs and arguments by the parties and by the attorneys for certain of the jurors and for the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill. On Friday, January the 26th, 2024, I conducted a hearing on this matter in which I took testimony from one of the jurors. The test, the conduct of the examination conducted solely by me. I received further argument from the attorneys for the state and for the defendant. Today, January the 29th, 2024, I have taken sworn testimony from the remaining 11 jurors uh, who rendered a verdict in this case. Uh, this examination was conducted solely my, by me. I have found no case that provides otherwise in the many cases I have read on the subject of a motion for a new trial on the basis of after discovered evidence of jury tampering or misconduct. I have also received sworn testimony from the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill. A direct examination was conducted by Deputy Attorney General Creighton Waters. Cross-examination was conducted by uh, Defendant Attorney Richard Harputlian. 
I have also propounded questions uh, myself to the clerk of court. I also received testimony from the clerk of court for Barnwell County, Rhonda McElveen, uh, who attended most of the trial and assisted uh, the clerk of court for Carlton County. I've also received testimony from the remaining alternate juror uh, who was, uh, uh, when the matter was deliberated, uh, dismissed from further service. The following is my ruling on the defendant's motion. The standard of proof. The state contends that in order to prevail, the defendant must show, one, that the clerk of court made an improper comment or propounded an improper question to the member of the jury, uh, to a member of the jury who rendered the verdict. Two, defendant must further show that Ms. Hill's improper comment or question actually influenced the juror's verdict, citing State v. Green, State v. Aldrett, and other uh, opinions of our Supreme Court and uh, other authorities. Defendant contends that he must show only that an improper question or comment was propounded to any juror by Clerk of Court Hill. If so proved, the defendant contends that the motion for the new trial must be granted. Defendant relies on United States v. Rimmer and many other cases. My ruling is this. On the law, the defendant has the burden of proving both the fact of the improper comment uh, or question by the clerk of court, Rebecca Hill, to juror, a juror or jurors, and two, prejudice suffered by the defendant, specifically that the Hill improper comments uh, in, uh, to the juror or jurors influenced the juror to vote to convict the defendant Murdoch. The facts. Did clerk of court Hill make comments to any juror which expressed her opinion of what the verdict would be? Ms. Hill denies A, and so the question becomes, was her denial credible? I find that the clerk of court is not completely credible as a witness. Ms. Hill was attracted by the siren call of celebrity. She wanted to write a book about the trial and express that as early as November 2022, long before the trial began. She denies that uh, uh, this is so, but I find uh, that she stated to the clerk of court, Rhonda McElveen and others, her desire for a guilty verdict because it would sell books. She made comments about Murdoch's demeanor as he testified, and she made some of those comments uh, before he testified to at least one and maybe more jurors. Did Clerk of Court Hill's comments have any impact on the verdict of the jury? I find that the answer to this question is no. Each member of this jury took their involuntary assignment very seriously. They obeyed the instructions of the court. They obeyed their oath. These good and decent citizens of Carlton County stood to their duty and rendered their verdict without fear or favor. It was a difficult task. Eleven of the jurors very unconditionally said uh, they either heard no comment or if they heard a comment, it had no effect. One juror was ambivalent in her testimony. She was then examined on her previous affidavit in which she said the effect, if any, that she had was pressure she felt from other jurors. The cases are myriad that pressure from fellow jurors is a part of the normal give and take of jury deliberations. The court is not to inquire in any way about what is said in those deliberations. But the juror who was somewhat ambivalent said on her oath at the time of trial twice and said on her oath before me in these proceedings that she stood to her oath. The clerk of court allowed public attention of the moment to overcome her duty. 
I have read the entire transcript of this lengthy trial, not an easy task. I have studied in detail all of the authorities cited. I have in independently researched the case law, learned treatises, and scholarly articles on the subject. Although there is certainly a split in the federal circuits and in the states on the standard of review, I simply do not believe that the authority of our South Carolina Supreme Court requires a new trial in a very lengthy trial such as this on the strength of some fleeting and foolish comments by a publicity-influenced clerk of court. This is a matter within the discretion of the trial judge, and I am the trial judge at this moment. I do not feel that I abuse my discretion when I find the defendant's motion for a new trial on the factual record before me must be denied, and it is so ordered. I will file a fuller order which denies this motion on the grounds I have recited on the record before me as a trial judge uh, and the authorities that have been cited by all parties in this matter. To that end, I will hold the record open. I direct that within four business days of receipt by the attorneys in this matter of a transcript of these proceedings, a proposed order by the state denying the defendant's motion for a new trial with citations uh, be sent to me and to opposing counsel. I will allow the defendant four business days from receipt of the state's proposed order to lodge objections and or submit an alternative proposed order. Upon receipt by uh, the court of all proposed orders, I will finalize this record, submit a written order, and I will at that time transmit the written order to the Court of Appeals, uh, the court which has remanded this matter to me. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, I, let me say this, uh, and I should have said it before I began my order. We got, we, hey, me members of the uh, audience, would you just be patient with me for one more minute? Please keep your seats. I have probably had more experience with trial and appellate work than anyone else in this room uh, for many years, and it has been an absolute pleasure to receive from these learned lawyers some of the best briefs I've ever received. I know they're a product not just of the attorneys who presented to me, but of the attorneys who sit with them uh, and help compose the research and the writings that I received. I know that I put you on a very tight timeline, but my feeling is that these matters are best disposed of uh, by the trial judge uh, in a very timely manner so that you may then go to the authorities that really count more than I do, uh, that is, the appellate authorities who will decide what the standard in this particular matter is. I've not seen a case such as this before. I doubt whether uh, our appellate judges have seen a case such as this before. And they will take uh, a lengthy time to study the record in this matter, the record in the part remanded to me. There are many issues in this case, uh, issues over which I have absolutely no authority whatsoever. But I will say this about uh, the record now that I have read it, and I will say this uh, about the testimony uh, that I heard uh, Friday and today. Judge Newman said it best in his sentencing when he discussed the weight and the measure of the of the uh, case presented in the testimony and evidence submitted in this case when it was tried. It is a very compelling case supporting the verdict that the jurors reached. Uh, he said it with a lot more detail than I do, but now that I've read the record, uh, uh, I say as the successor trial judge, I agree that the evidence was overwhelming and the jury verdict not surprising. This matter is now adjourned.